is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Radio. We've got a panel who know a thing or two about being trailblazers. All right, sport was already kind of impeded upon. Sinead Kassan. There's an innate interest in it anyway. Dermot Ling, it didn't blow me away with him. Jason Sherlock and Kieran Donaghy with us. Basketball would have been my main game. Retro panel for you now. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Retro Panel. Wednesdays and Thursdays from 4. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. A very good morning to you. You are welcome along to OTB AM. I'm Jerry Gilroy here with you until 9.30 this morning. Also here this morning is Owen Sheehan, who uh, I suspect is still blown away by events yesterday. <laughs> blown away by events is right. Came off air yesterday and you always hate when big news breaks right at the end of the show. But that's precisely what happened yesterday. Kind of heartbreak from a journalistic standpoint because we like to cover all the big stories here live and as they happen. But unfortunately, Kevin Kilban's engagement came out at 9.35 a.m. yesterday. Ah, uh, there was some... Anyway, yes, okay, fair enough, yes. That's what we'll... We'll go with that. Um, it was the biggest traffic day in the history of OffTheBall.com. It certainly was. It certainly was. The video of uh, a man proposing is always good content, but when it's a man who has, what is it, 110 caps to the Republic of Ireland proposing in such dramatic fashion, I think it goes to a whole new level. You know who that is? For everybody who, I'm, like, I'm sure nobody's even considering joining us this morning without having done their homework and seen the video, but if not, let's oh. do a quick frame-by-frame -frame breakdown of, in my opinion, the, one of the best proposals from an Irish footballer ever. I can't think of any other video from uh, yeah, an Irish okay, yeah, proposing. Yeah, also, uh, it, it started like this, Kevin Kilban in a restaurant, a swanky looking restaurant, singing Grace. Good song, good choice of song. It, yeah, it, so he'd, he'd arranged for it to be on in the background and when the first verse was on, the first verse was on the mm. speakers and then they, they killed it. Mm. So he would come in and, and do the bit about the wedding ring. Yeah, it's uh, because we all know what's going to happen next, there's a wedding ring involved. Then. He does the old switcheroo, gets down on one knee, and now Brianne knows something's up. Now she knows that shit is about to get real. A, a decision is going to have to be made. And subsequently, a uh, handy assistant comes along, the cake with a ring, and we move it on one more frame, and you can hear her saying, you can't be effing serious <laughs> when Kevin does it. At which point, you'd imagine Kevin's head is going am 90. I, am I serious? Is there a way I can get out of this in case she's like, no? And then we can move on to the final frame, which is just pure and utter relief from Kevin Kilban. I don't care what he says, it was relief that he felt. Because for that brief moment, I'm sure it was a small bit of panic. He uh, said every second seemed like uh, a minute, so it seemed like 15 minutes. Yeah, we might go through some of that. I might grab some of those papers off you there. Um, That's the, uh, that is, the uh, we'll start with the sun uh, in page 13 inside. Uh, Kevin doesn't skate around, engaged to Ice Pro Brianne after two months. Romantic Kevin serenaded his lover by singing to Dubliner's Grace in a packed restaurant and then got down on one knee with a ring worth almost 65,000 euro. Kilban, affectionately dubbed Killer by Ireland supporters, was eliminated from the skating show last week but admitted finding love was the real prize. Did you just show the picture of him in there? Yeah. So I don't know if anybody watched the show last week but um, you can't really make it out there. His lips are covered in uh, Brianne's lipstick. Um, <laughs> Uh, it looks like he's been wearing pink lipstick, as it was on telly the other night after they had a big smoochy smoochy. Yes. Um, it's a uh, contagious lipstick, I think it's fair to say. The Irish Daily Star then. It's Ice Dew. Ah, you see what they did there? Not really. <laughs> no extra time for Kev as he pops question after just four months. So they said two months here in this on four months in the star, I think four months is the accurate uh, representation. We think it's three. We're saying three, okay, Yeah, I think it's a... She looked stunned as he serenaded her before a waiter came to the table with a cake, says the Irish Daily Star this morning. And the ring. Afterwards, they spent the night at a posh five-star hotel in Kensington. Hey. He tell what did they do have, there, Owen? Uh, I considered where they were going to move after marriage, discussed opening song, opening Signed dance. Signed a prenup, got to organise the prenup, is that it? Precisely, sending out wedding invitations. Is there another one? There's tons of them. They've got the Irish Daily Mail here, page three. This is probably the most, they've gone for like the official Dancing on Ice uh, photograph. Dancing for joy, Kilban pops question to skate partner. Kilban, 42, who played for Ireland 110 times, scoring eight times, was seen serenading his pro skating partner in the STK London Steakhouse 
before dropping to one knee. So throughout the tabloids this morning, we're trying to piece together the location of uh, this big event and uh, successfully doing so. The mirror, meanwhile, this is probably tab of the morning to you, with this rink, dot, dot, dot. Kevin Kilban proposes to Dancing on Ice partner Brianne after just two months. Uh, their description of events was, as a waiter brings over a cake with a glistening ring beside it, he begins to serenade her to the delight of other diners. Brianne asks, are you serious? Leaving out a, a word conveniently there. She then says yes, and the restaurant erupts in cheers. Though the pair were booted off Dancing on Ice during last Sunday's episode, they didn't let it dampen their spirits. Which is uh, very true indeed. I think there's, it's in the Independent and in the Herald as well this morning, but that pretty much uh, sums up the coverage of Kevin Kilban this morning. Yeah, so um, just looking up, the, I'm surprised they didn't say it like at the STK London where it's like 75 euros per steak. That, that's saying, oh, they can get Wagyu, Wagyu skirt. All right, okay, you're, you're on the website. Yeah. Kevin thanked them on his Instagram as well. In fairness, they did a, they did a good job. They arrived at just the right time and the, the, the uh, waiter's face, he's like putting the ring and the cake down going, she hasn't said yes yet. And he's kind of standing there going, I'm going to bear witness to this thing forever. And, and then she says yes. And he's like, yeah. So there was like a, a precise moment where he understood exactly what was going to happen too, that mm. this could go tits up. Has uh, anybody got any ideas for the stag do yet? Like, a, I would like to hear from all, well, all, if all anybody, the viewers if, and listeners. Yeah, if anybody wants to, like, you know, throw it out there for... Is there an STK in Dublin or in anywhere in our... Is there an STK in Mayo? He says he wants to go somewhere in the West Coast. Well, the wedding's going to be in Mayo, I think. Okay. I mean, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, as somebody in the office said, if she takes his name, she's going to be Brianne Kilban. <laughs> It was Tom Malone. I'm going to give him the full credit and uh, and blame. It's so okay, great you're, name. If you're watching, name. It's like um, yeah, it's an amazing stage name. Fantastic, absolutely brilliant. I mean, obviously, she'd probably just keep her own name, given that she's a world famous skater at this point. But like, you know, just in case. Mm. Anyway, sports news this morning. Tyrone handed a big, big boost. Colin McShane is going to be staying and available for the championship. The All Star forward will stay in Ireland and not pursue an AFL career. Adelaide Crows had issued a statement this morning. Uh, Adelaide Crows, yeah, they've... Uh, Essentially said that he wasn't prepared or wasn't ready to move yeah. across the world. And um, uh, Justin Reid, who's uh, the Crows' general manager, list management and uh, strategy. So he said that he was determined that it was in his best interest to stay in Ireland after weighing up all considerations. This is from Team Talk Mag uh, in Tyrone. It is a big decision to relocate to the other side of the world and pursue a professional career in a different sport, said Reid. Ultimately, this was not something that Cahal was ready for, and we wish him the very best in his endeavours, both on and off the field. We will continue to look for opportunities to bring talent into our club. So it seems that McShane has made the decision himself that he won't be going to Adelaide, he won't be going to the AFL. Big news for Tyrone. Huge. Does it change their position in the... It does change their position in the power oh, rankings. completely and utterly changes their position in the power rankings because they, they, they were the like, third best team in the country last year, as things turned out. And they now have n lost very few players. If any, like, I, to be honest, I'm holding my hands up and say, once Colin McShane had left the country, I was thinking to myself, well, you can forget about Tyrone as, uh, even as a semi-finalist, they will do very, very well to get there. So now they're... Completely they're turns it on its head. Fringe fourth, fifth? Yeah, like... You win Ulster and you're into well, I win Ulster and it's a hand into a semi final. Yeah. You you would expect you'd expect them to have a, a good chance of like it all depends on who comes through the back door into the Super Eights, but at least you're not going to be playing Kerry or Dublin you'd expect in a Super Eights draw. So winning an Ulster championship this year would be their big aim and McShane gives them every chance of doing that. Mixed night for the Irish last night in the FA Cup. Um, Spurs got the better of a five goal thriller to see off the challenge of Southampton in their FA Cup fourth round replay. Hyun Ming Sun scored a penalty three minutes before time. And that uh, saw them win 3-2. Shane Long scored for Southampton. Uh, he started that game, scored their first goal. Ogafemi was on the bench. Troy Parrott on the bench, but not getting a moment. Uh, Spurs award is a home tie with Norwich in the fifth round. Celtic still seven points clear at the top of the uh, Scottish Premiership. The leaders maintained their winning run since the winter break with a 4-0 victory at Motherwell last night. Rangers beat Hibs 2-1. Uh, Darrell Horgan on the bench for Hibs came off with about 20 minutes to go. In that one, GMAC will look to bring his Saudi international form to the Pebble Beach Pro-Am, which gets underway in California later today. Last week's winner on the European Tour plays in a group with Brandon Grace, Seamus Power and Park Harrington also in action this week. An interesting piece in the Times today uh, saying that GMAC is a potential for the Olympics and we might have three male golfers in the Olympics. I didn't even know it was a possibility. So he's, he's got so many ranking points at the start since the start of the year. Uh, I think he's like third in like calendar year for Olympic ranking points that um, there's a good chance he's going to make it. Racing today, a seven-card race, sorry, a seven-race 
card at Thurless, which goes to post at uh, one fifteen for the first race. And the 2020 Premier League dart season gets underway. I'm not telling that. None of your business. None of your business. Who do you, who do you support in the Premier League? Um, is there, I don't even know how it works. Villa. You don't know how it works. It starts. It's not that complicated. It's a league. You play against somebody. You, if you win your game, as an you go higher in the league. Do you have a club if team? If you lose your games, you're less likely to go higher in the why league. Is there, why is there a league? What is it, what's the point of that? What's because the... darts needed a week-by-week -week thing rather than just being in the spotlight around Christmas and you've you got the top we players. You have to have this all year? You, they've got the top players playing each other every week on right. Thursday night. It's nice Thursday, yeah. It's been Thursday nights for like 10 years. And do uh, people watch it? Tons of people watch it. Tons and tons of people watch it, yeah. It's great. So let me, let me just, so the, the darts has been made by Sky. It has been made by pay TV. And yet you're saying constantly, oh, you can't put stuff on pay TV. No one will ever watch it. And yet look at the, look at the way darts has wormed its way into the popular imagination. It's not me who's saying that. Who's that? So what? It was Ryle Nugent saying it. You were like, totally agreeing with him. You're like, yeah, I totally agree with Ryle. Yeah, but you were like, like, oh, Ryle's, Ryle's got game here. Yeah, you no, were saying. I'd, I'd agree with his take. Ryle's my guy. I'm, I'm on Team Ryle, basically. For, for Batham, I think you were kind of quoting Ryle Nugent there, not me. Which is fine. You, no, can, you, you, you can get the two of us mixed up, that's okay. Well, you, you said you agreed with everything he said. Here's what's coming up on the show. Uh, Michael Brickwall, 7.45. Um, one of the first times that we've ever had the opportunity to speak to uh, Brickwall. <laughs> he just didn't do media when he was playing. Um, we'll talk to him about that. Uh, top five stories coming your way at 8 o'clock. The Shot Clock with Kieran Donnelly at 8.15. If you want us to talk about anything specific on the Shot Clock any week, Use the hashtag OTBAM and we'll, um, we'll put those topics to Kieran. Uh, sports News with Tom Malone at 8.35. Uh, talking some Getty Football at 8.45. Virtual Insanity, John Duggan's golf tips at 9 o'clock and uh, return to the top five stories at 9.15. Bring you through the papers now. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The uh, back page of the Herald this morning. Quinn, we'll fix up leagues. So Niall Quinn was obviously doing media yesterday. He was asked the big questions by uh, our man Will, who was asking him all about um, Kev's engagement and actually got some great stuff from him. But anyway, uh, condition set in rescue deal as FAI aim to regain trust. This is Dan McDonald's story. Same piece is carried in the uh, Independent, obviously. How DCU paved way for dub success. Uh, manager Moyna recounts naughty glory. Um, is that Paddy Andrews? It looks like uh, with a picture there winning the DCU. Would that be right, Tommy? Is Paddy Andrews one of your DCU teammates? No, he wasn't listening. That's great. Thanks, Tommy. AFL raids is uh, AFL raids are insane, Moynihan. So this is interesting. Seamus Moynihan says um, that he wants the AFL to pay and compensate clubs when they steal players. And this is exactly the deal that had been brokered by Ty Canelli, because they do that for everybody. That's like a, it's exactly the same if Home Farm send a player to Liverpool or Man United, Liverpool or Man United play, pay Home Farm a development fee. Um, and obviously the GAA can't accept it because they're an amateur organisation. So maybe there is some mechanism for this to happen. Maybe it's as simple as you take a professional player who has made an inter-county appearance at minor level or above, you then get compensated. Very strict parameters there. It will only be for a couple of players and the money goes straight to the club rather than to the county. Therefore, the county can take control of you know, some of the athletic minors who perhaps aren't as talented football-wise and can start chipping them off. The club would always make use of those players and therefore they should be the ones who benefit. I can see it happen in practice. The GEA say it's messy, but I wonder if they are the very strict rules for shipping a player off to Australia it would actually be fine and it wouldn't be the start of something that would be kind of like opening the, the floodgates or something. Yeah, it would, yeah, you'd try and do, would you do a really good deal? You'd do like, is it 100 grand? It's not, is it? Is it 20 grand? It's not 100 grand anyway, because what are they earning a year? 40. 40. So maybe, like, is it, is it worth probably one year's wages, is it? Like with 40 grand, you, you pay your, your... And then, the, cause he, uh, Moynihan's point is it just puts up a barrier so they're not just hoovering everybody up and going, well, so there's no risk. Like, at the moment, it is ultimately... I know, like I said, it's not risk-free. You've got to pay flights and you've got to pay the salary. But if you get a player who you pay 40 grand for three years, he turns into a, a guy who, like, plays 50% of the time, then happy days. Happy days is right. So what's one more 40 grand? I think it should be whatever your contract is, then a one-year salary goes to the, the club. Is that fair? Yeah, the only thing is then if I... start undercutting exactly the players. Exactly, the players. So, oh, at that so point, it should be a flat fee of yeah. like 30 to 50, something, something along those lines. Should the money go to the player? 
No. The player's getting p paid professionally anyway. This is the opportunity for is it the player to, to pay How much should go to the GPA? <laughs> Nothing. How much should go to the agent? None. Right. It's going straight to the club. Right. Well, the agent can get his own fee by talking to the player himself. Um, but if the agent gets the money for the club... So let's say there's a player who's like, um, you know, a, a fringe intercounty player, but mm -hmm. has a great agent who goes, you're actually, you've got the perfect athletic profile for an AFL team. You go off, you do the combine, and you succeed, and then you go and you, you do two trials for different clubs. You're saying the agent is making the club money. Yeah. So they should get a cut of that. Yeah, look, that's what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm just saying that this is how business works. Mm. That somebody's going to go, hang on a second. How exactly does that... Well, so that, that should be up to the club to negotiate their own private terms with the agent. Well, the club, say, well, the club needs can, a flat fee, that's the thing. You the AFL needs to be paying the club directly, if, in, in your model. Well, like, if I'm, if I'm running a GA club, this sounds terrible, but I would be sent to an agent. If you can get one of my players to Australia, I'll give you 10%. If you can get two of them to Australia, I'll give you 20%. <laughs> no, it gets lower. It gets, it gets 8%. <laughs> is, that, is that how it works? Yeah. Well, because you're, you're, well I'll never be a chairman of a GA club. <laughs> but also, it's, it's actually kind of absurd when you say, put it in those terms. Can you try and... Can uh, you horse out my teenage? You would like to think that it would never, ever come to that. that like, that's exactly what it would do. GA clubs actually prefer success because they have one of their best players available to them. Yeah, but, you know... I don't know. Look, it, 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 it becomes a very difficult thing to negotiate. Unless every time a player goes, money goes centrally to the GEA and they distribute it. So here's the thing, right? That under 14, say they went to a development squad with the county, and that's where they end up getting the best level of coaching, because more than likely that's where they are getting access to, you know, some coaching ticket that has been brought together by the best available coaches in the county and they go through the grades under 14, under 16, minor, win a minor All-Ireland and they're like a, a superstar. What role does the club play? What role does the county play? Does that have to break down a bit? Can that money just be ring-fenced for coaching in the county? So it's not specifically mm. to the club. Wouldn't that be better? I guess it would, but you're saying giving it essentially to Crow Park. Well, I'm saying that, so this goes... The AFL, 10 players from Ireland who are Irish qualified uh, end up going to the AFL next year. For that, the AFL pays Croke Park 400 grand and that 400 grand goes straight into a coaching pot and that coaching like, shouldn't necessarily just be going to the counties that are producing these players. It should probably be spread across everybody. Like, say three dubs and four Kerry lads go one season, mm. right? Does all that money then go into Dublin and Kerry again who are already are producing all these players? Or should it actually be going to... Carlo and Leitrim and Laird. This is not just an opportunity for them to rebalance things. Well, I don't know about that. I think that if your county is actually producing these players, because you actually you make a, a valid point that the development squads are doing a lot for these young players. But no, I don't think it should be spread around different counties. I think that if the county is responsible for producing these players, then their club and their county perhaps should get a slice of the pie and the entire pie should be for them. Like, and then it's a, it's a huge boost then to someone like Louth who have had a player uh, who have had a player go to the AFL. Extra footballers. Extra footballers, the same, that they will get that boost as well. Like, if... Should the money, I, I don't know, like maybe the money can only be spent on something. I, I can't decide if the money should be spent on coaching or if it should be spent on capital or if the club gets to decide what the hell they want to do with it. Because the trouble with that is that an outside Some manager comes in, there's like a carpet bagger outside manager coming in who goes like, 40 grand, lads, yeah, that's... How much is your fee this year? 40 grand? That is 100% possibility. 100% possibility of that happening. That, that is the real danger of it. So coaching would be, I don't want to say a foolproof way of doing it, but if it is for development within counties and for underage coaching and, I don't know, for your development officers that go around to schools and coach well, so the, the and there's people. And there's a template there. Like every county already has those uh, GDAs in place and, and some of the clubs... Certainly in Dublin, the club pays half and the county pays half, and I don't know that. I presume that's not the case in, in every club, but what do you think? Yeah, like I, I know for a fact that there are clubs who... And the uh, AFL have said to Ty Canelli in the past, this, this money is available for them. Oh, so I, Seamus Moynihan is calling for something that Ty Canelli has already broken Yeah, the AFL have no issue with this, absolutely not. I'm sure they kind of feel like they're on a runaway train here and they don't know how they're getting away with it. Um, we better move on. Back page of the mirror is a special sun. Jose's delight has Spurs see off Saints in Cup with late penalty. Uh, the Irish Daily Mail then is taking a stand. CJ hits back at Trolls for going after his family. That is the Irish Daily Mail. The Irish Daily Star then, on the back page, we've already shown you the Kilban story, is Iggy Stardust, 
Odi Nagalo has spoken for the first time since becoming a Manchester United player. He's looking to save United's forward woes. Uh, Quinn says critics have it wrong. Seamus uh, on the mark there, as you've already mentioned, and sun rises to the occasion. The uh, Irish Times uh, rugby first two pages. Stander stands up to the flak. I've always got a point to prove. Performance and numbers stack up, and Ireland are lucky to have them, says Jerry Thornley. Concussions bring high tackle trial into focus. And CBC deal held up as unions insist on terrestrial TV. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. So that's the CBC deal where um, 300 million, 300 million is going to go to the uh, unions, the six unions in the Six Nations, but only if they can agree a deal. And then there's um, a Flesh Seamus Moynihan story as well. Um, is there anything else? Yeah, there's a uh, strong League of Ireland key to the game's future, says Niall Quinn. There's also... Um, Focus on the women's rugby team this week. New Dawn says the back of the sun. Messi row at Barca has Pep on red alert. Manchester City are going to swoop for Lionel Messi if he doesn't patch things up with Eric Abidal and Barcelona. And Spanish giants join race for Grealish. Barcelona and Real Madrid have joined the race to sign Aston Villa star Jack Grealish. Both of the Spanish giants are tracking the playmaker as they choose their top transfer targets for the summer. It's emergency ward prowse. Uh, horror injury for Saints Ace. Uh, then Sun has the name. Pain. Yeah, it looks bad. It looked like there was already a scab there, and it's just broken. No, oh. I'm not sure what his scab history is. Uh, United, uh, we will stand. Uh, says Niall Quinn. He's open to a chat about a United Ireland team. Uh, talking kind of loosely about that yesterday, obviously respecting all the wishes of the IFA and uh, the Irish League before kind of saying, yes, this is something that is definitely going to happen. He's open to it. Uh, yeah, look, uh, the door's always open, he says. It's a, that's the political answer, and it, it's bang on. It's exactly what it should be. Uh, Quinn, trust us and will deliver. Interim CEO promises League of Ireland action, but urges caution on all island plans. Uh, my fear is that we may have got the wrong Englishman in charge, says Neil Francis, uh, who obviously is talking about Stuart Lancaster there. And huge boost for Tyrone as McShane to stay on. This is big, big news. Tyrone are now up to fifth or fourth in Owen Sheehan's power rankings at the end of the year. Your predictive power rankings? Possibly f third or fourth. Third I mean, possibly. there's not possibly. It's the end, of the end of the year. They either are or they aren't. Third. Third? Yeah. Right. Right, so you've got Dublin, Kerry, Tyrone. Yeah. They're ahead of Donegal and they're ahead of Galway now. You see, you're putting me on the spot here. I am, like, but like you're, you are the power rankings maestro. Come on. You know what? Fifth. <sighs> Right, I've changed my mind completely. Fifth, I've changed my mind. Uh, two more for me. Have you got to go on yet? Irish Examiner, United Ireland. Quinn diffuses basketball route. Wants Irish sports to grow together and holding the line. CJ Stander on the fine margins between criticism and abuse. Uh, two more for me. One is the Irish News. Uh, GAA has become ripe for the picking by AFL, says Moynihan. I think Kerry feel this more pronounced because Tig was doing it and um, Tomas O'Shea didn't like that. Yeah, and then you had David Clifford being linked. Which was yeah, but he didn't go in the end. I know, but when you had they had to get their shit together. He's definitely the highest profile talent that has ever imagine been. If gone. <laughs> imagine if he'd gone. Imagine if he got. But we would have been sitting here saying, ah, you know, he's only a minor. Yeah. Anyway, four, four, it was, it was wasn't minor that good anyway. Yeah, he's, the, he's never going to make it. As the loop of the highlights from Croke Park. Which is what we're saying about Mark O'Connor now. Again and again and again and again. Uh, right, so 7.53, one more for you. Impressed yeah. with the manner of the victory, if not, who is that young man? Who is that fresh-faced, clean-shaven young man? Mm, I don't know. What is that? that was like, how long ago was that on? 15 years? Uh, 14. This is Owen Sheehan's column in Kerry's Eye. I was comparing Jose to Peter Keane this morning. While there is a string of improvements still required, we can take comfort from the way Kerry snatched two league points from a precarious situation. Jose Mourinho sat there with a belly full of glee, full stop. He'd watched his Tottenham Hotspur side. That's what your full stop enunciations. Pep Guardiola's Man City in classic Jose style and Mourinho special, comma. How does the cow lie? Uh, if you will. Oh, yeah. All right. It's good stuff, Owen. Is Everybody it, should go out and buy the carries What else did I say? That's yeah, all I've read. It's like you didn't read it. How can you say it's good stuff if you haven't read the column? Because well, I, I know you. I trust you. Are you patronising me by saying it's good stuff and you haven't even read the column? <laughs> I trust you. No, like you, you haven't read the column and you're saying it's good stuff. I saw you yesterday squeaking out the words like, you know, like a... A constipated two-year-old speaking out their first poo. Like, <laughs> that's what you were like. I could see the sweat on your brow. Yesterday. The beads. I write that out on a Sunday evening, hence the, it was just after watching Jose. Uh, right, 7.54 this morning. Kerry's eye, where can, I, where can we get it? I don't know, you tell me. You've clearly read the column. <laughs> it's great stuff, apparently. You're not even going to advertise you your own me, column. You saw me writing it, apparently. When... OK, time for our main story this morning. Michael Brick Walsh joined us in studio yesterday uh, here on OTBAM. It was our first time to properly chat to him ever on Off The Ball. Uh, you're going to enjoy this. Have a look. OTB.
a.m. This is OTB Sports Radio. Right, so Electric Ireland have live-streamed a number of key games throughout the 2020 season to date and will stream both Electric Ireland Fitzgibbon Cup semi-finals this weekend. Check out electricireland.ie forward slash HEC or GA.ie forward slash GA now to access the streams. Electric Ireland's first class rivals campaign in 2020 celebrates the unique aspect of the Electric Ireland Sigerson and Fitzgibbon Cups which sees the formation of unexpected alliances when county rivals unite to play for their college in pursuit of one common goal. Michael Walsh, Michael Brick Welsh is our uh, is our guest he's an electric car and a buster what's the name what 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 are we supposed to call you i uh, go with michael we'll michael? michael yeah we'll we skip it there and your surname welsh you're welsh grant well that's okay that's easy and what's the story with brick who gets to use that um uh, we use it on the field maybe not in the studio right fair enough <laughs> are you retiring brick is that done are you no longer brick yeah, we'll, we, we'll take a break on it. I know, to be fair, I'm probably stuck with it for the rest of my life. It probably, uh, probably um, got caught with it in school and it has stuck ever since, you know. How? What, do you remember the day? Do you remember, like, it was just... I know, it was handed down. I think an older brother had a nickname and they just handed it down to me. But it went so bad in Warford, people thought it was a double barrel name at one stage. <laughs> so... I, uh, un unfortunately, I'm stuck with that and I have, to get I have to get used to it. So. What about the brick flick, then? Is that patented? Yeah, um, I, I was talking to uh, doing a bit of media earlier, and we were, we were talking about it. And I, I, I suppose uh, the genius that came up with it obviously came up with two words that rhymed. So I, I suppose I'm stuck with it, stuck with that as well. <laughs> Could have been but, worse. There uh, are some. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Could have been a lot worse. <laughs> Big brick in energy, I think, yeah. is your. Uh, so how is retirement going? Uh, Actually, look, there hasn't much changed yet, I suppose, here, at the moment, like, the lads are in pre-season, you know, and they're... Uh, Isn't that, I'd say? Yeah, you, well, I, look, to be fair... I was being sarcastic, I, I, you're I, actually, yeah. you're like... I, I always enjoy training, like, you know what I mean? So it is, it, it is a bit of a miss, but, like, you know, I, I, I suppose I'm not seeing, like, they've two games played of significance so far, like, but when the evenings get longer and things like that, you'll probably miss it that bit more, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm kept busy at home, and obviously, when you're, people think when you retire from, from county, that's it, they don't realise you're going back to your club as well, like, you know, and I'll be obviously playing for a few more years until they tell me to give it up, and then you'll obviously have the underage and things like that to, to get involved in as well. So that's there's a, a plan in place to make to fill your hours. Ah, there is, yeah. But look, not a whole pile of thinking has got into a jet. I suppose I've only gone with four or five months. I've been involved in Warford, thank God, since I was eighteen, nineteen. You know, so that's a long while ago now, as everyone reminds me. And uh, you know, so it, it will be a big change for me. But not yet, I suppose. When the evenings get longer and when you're starting to go to the matches and things like that, that'll be that'll be a big thing when you can't impact. Um, impact an outcome of a game or anything like that, that's a big change, you know. Why did you stop? Uh, look, in fairness, I was very lucky to keep going for as long as I did. I uh, was extremely lucky that managers uh, wanted me for that for that period of time and I knew at the end of last year it was time to go, you know, I don't I, know if, as I said, I was very lucky to play as long as I did and at any time I could have been told I, I wasn't wanted anymore, you know what I mean, but I was lucky to, lucky to get as far as I did. Was it a clear-cut decision? I was, yeah. I was, I was lucky enough, I suppose, to, to, to come back last year and, uh, and play again, like, you know, and, uh, but, you know, because it's probably 50-50, probably the year before. But then, you know, you get back into it and you drive on and then you make your decision again last year, uh, again, at the end of last year, you know, and look, I, I, I was happy. I played for as long as I did and enjoyed, enjoyed as, as much as I did. You, there must have been a slight temptation with the new manager coming in to just give it one more year. Ah, no, look, I, I, I knew, like, in fairness, they're very lucky with Liam Cahill. I'd say he's a, an excellent man, like, you know, but he knew I, I wasn't going back, and I'd say he was probably happy enough I wasn't going back <laughs> as well. But, uh, but uh, you know, look, he, 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 he's building his own set-up and his own team now, and in fairness, it's about GA and any sport is about youth, and I was lucky, as I said, to enjoy it for as long as I did and be part of it for as long as I did. But it's all about the younger players now, and Watford have numerous younger players coming through and hopefully they'll get their chance and take it this year. Have you gone to any games yet or are you going to leave that off for a while? Um, I, I, I didn't get to go to the, the Cork game. I was hoping to get to that. Obviously the Westmead game was up in Westmead but uh, no, I will. I, I, I'm going to look forward to being a supporter. I haven't been a supporter with as I said, which uh, the bones uh, 20 years, I suppose, uh, nearly. Uh, so I'll enjoy getting back to that. I suppose the only difficult thing from a past player's point of view is when you hear people being so critical of players. Like, you know what I mean? It's hard to sit in the stand and people 
cutting up players that have obviously put in the time and effort and work and things mightn't be going for as well on the day. You know, people don't realise you might be you might be a good player and you might be trying your best, but you're on a fella that's the best in his county and he's obviously trying his best and people don't appreciate that some days it goes for you and some days it goes against you, you know. Can you hear that when you're playing? No, I never, to be honest about it, people would say to me it was a great atmosphere or it was, there was a great crowd there or whatever. I would actually wouldn't be able to tell uh, who was there or whatever, you know what I mean? It's it's rare. I suppose when you're f so focused on it and yeah. particularly the inter-county, like it's rare that there's a game where there's only, like the, the lesser people, you're more inclined to hear that as a, at a club game than you are at a county game, you know? Yeah, I'd say, and as the county player playing in a club match, sometimes you get it more than everybody else. Ah, you do, because I suppose, number one, I suppose you're on the ball a bit more, like, you know what I mean? Maybe in, in some circumstances, and you may not touch the ball either, you know, but people are expecting a lot, and sometimes, again, it goes for you. But when people, it's easy for, often a, an inter-county player playing a club game, he draws attention from two or three, or they're watching out for him, like, and they're cutting him off, and other fellas can play well, and they're saying, where's, your, where's my inter-county player? He's not touching the ball, or he's not doing this. But that is the way they, they draw attention from opposing players and from opposing supporters and even their own supporters. Yeah. When you made the decision to retire, what did you look back on and think, yeah, I like that, or Jesus, was there an itch that you didn't scratch? I look, obviously, I, 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 like everyone, uh, well, you'd think everyone anyway, my, my biggest thing was, I suppose, to win in All-Ireland. When, when I came onto the inter-county scene, uh, first Warford were they probably had won the Munster final in 2002, which is a massive step for, for Waterford from the, for, at that time from where they were coming from. But like my career, I suppose, I would have loved to win in All-Ireland and I suppose that was the ultimate goal and unfortunately it was unsuccessful for me. Like, it, it's, it'll always be a disappointment for me. I, I, like, it's not as if I think about it every morning or anything like that, but that's what you want. You want to, I always wanted to finish the year as a winner, you know what I mean? And I never was. Probably, obviously, wasn't good enough because you know a team like the best team always wins, and there's no point in saying otherwise. You know. I'm not sure about that. Sometimes teams get a bit lucky. Like, uh, they're, they're, look, it's very rare, right? And that Galway team was a great team. You were also a great team. That Mayo team that never won All Ireland, they were a great team. Like, I, I, but we've had this conversation a bit recently. Um, Conor McDonald was in with us. Um, he's obviously younger and has just come off a season where I think Wexford will always think that was a really good chance for them because they had Tipperary on the rack and then Tipperary was so far ahead of Kilkenny they will talk themselves into it and they beat Kilkenny already so um, I want to play you this clip if we can uh, just turn the sound up on this so here's Conor McDonald. we were asking him if it's worth it if you're not winning all Ireland's. have a listen I would be very very disappointed if especially with the panel that we have now at the moment um, and the group of players that we have and the kind of core group we've had over the last five or six years if I was to wind up not winning an Ireland with those uh, like I'd be telling you life I thought I'd be happy with that um, that's just straight up I, if I if I winded up not winning a, uh, an Ireland I'm sure if you asked you know the likes of Brick Walsh who has been unbelievable he's picked up all the stars he'd trade them all in I'm sure you know He's just one example of, of, of so many. Yeah, he is um, a good example, though, because I think the rest of the country thinks he's had a great career. I'm yeah, sure he, well, he, I agree. I, I think he's had a, an unbelievable career. He's been he's been a stalwart for them for so many years. Um, I don't know whether he would measure success on that. I'm sure he does. I'm, I'm I can sure, say, you know, he's, I'm, he's, I'm sure he does measure his success, but, he, like, if you don't win an honour, I would say you measure your success differently after your, your playing career is over. So obviously we were talking about you in your absence. I apologise for that. It's a very rude thing to do. Um, at the same time, it's a great career. Like, the missing medal is just a missing medal. It shouldn't define you, I don't think. I will, to be fair, I probably agree with Connor. I know it's probably over the top and, and maybe some people might look at it as harsh, but it's something like, realistically, you, you, you go out every year. It's all about team success, you know what I mean? I don't... When I, if I, if I, and I admire, I said this earlier, I, I admire individual sports people. I don't know how they do it on their own. They're fantastic, like to be able to do it to, to drive themselves on when they might be having a bad day or might be sick or whatever. I, I, I'm part of a team, like you know, I was part of a team, and my ultimate thing was to to win with them. You know what I mean? So I was never too pushed on individual awards. It wasn't. That's not what I was doing it to get individual accolades or individual awards. It wasn't. It wasn't about that. It was the ten minutes after winning a game. That's what the biggest thing for me was. The running around in 
horrible conditions on a December night or a January evening or whatever. Uh, that was all to win the ultimate. And I, I, like again, now I'm not over it. There's no no pity or anything like that. It's just a disappointment from my point of view that we didn't win one. Yeah, but it, uh, the journey to not winning one isn't that different from the journey to win one. It's not like you can go back now and pinpoint, geez, if we'd done something in that training session or if that referee in decision had gone away, I would have a medal. It, does that change you as a person not having a medal, I wonder? And not at all. Like, you know, we'd, fan we'd, we'd fantastic times, like, you know what I mean, as a group. But, like, again, like, it's like, I suppose, maybe if you use it as a checklist or whatever, like, you know what I mean, and you want to... That's the way... I was, and not everyone is the same, you know what I mean? And uh, again, uh, 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 like the, the, the camaraderie, the crack, and uh, the team, uh, uh, the teams and players I, I was with, it was great, like, you know what I mean? But that said, what did I start doing it for, and what does any player start doing it for in, in when they start out? They want to win the ultimate, and the ultimate is not all middle, like, you know? And, like, to be fair, if, if Conor McDonald, for, from his point of view, wasn't saying that, you know what I mean? What, 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 yeah, why is, why is he bother playing with? And obviously he is, like, you know, but so as we start out here now in January, February again with the inter county scene, every uh, Hurland team is looking at that, you know what I mean? And they want to be the best, everyone wants to be the best, and they want to have something to show for it at the end of the year. And, and I was like that, harshly so, maybe, but that was, that was my opinion. But it was worth it. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. You'd yeah. do it all again. Ah, you knowing, would, yeah. yeah knowing yeah. now that you're not going to get one, you'd still bust the gut to do it. Yeah, you would. You might try, you might try and get there. But, uh, yeah, 100%, like, I, enjoy, I enjoyed it. I suppose the low points and things like that, you learn an awful lot about yourself, about your team when you lose. Uh, 100%, like, you know. But, look, it is... Uh, a fella say, uh, said in the dressing room before, and uh, always stuck with me. The ten, it's all about the ten minutes after after that game, like after winning. That's what it's all about. And it's a hundred percent is like you know, if you weren't into the team ethos, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be doing you wouldn't be playing a team sport. And that's what I always found. It wasn't it wasn't to slip back on an individual thing or anything like that. It was all about the overall medals together. Yeah, I like. I wonder when you kind of think about it that way, that that's what makes winning so special is that not everybody can have it. Knowing that this is exclusive to you, to whether it's a Munster Championship for that year or an All-Ireland Championship for that year, knowing that there will be people who don't have any of these medals, uh, like that's probably what makes it so great, the level of risk that is involved beforehand. Yeah, and again, I always sum up the going back to the individual stuff. Like you can always debate a, a, an All-Star or, or, or you can say, uh, he wasn't good enough or, or that fella should be in the team of the decade or this fella was better or he was a much better hurler. Uh, but you can't really, well, you definitely can't uh, debate an All-Ireland final and that's the thing. Like You, you get to the, t the summit and, and people say, oh, it wasn't a great hurling sh uh, championship or it wasn't a great football championship. But like no one is saying, oh, they don't deserve to win it. Like You know what I mean? You, 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 you get your just rewards like a, a, as a team and you have the medal to prove it and no one can argue with that. Um, the the All-Ireland final, is that a game that haunts you in any way or are you happy enough that you gave your best on that day? Uh, yeah, look, it, in 2017, it is disappointing looking back, but again, I would always go with the best team always wins. You can't make you can't make excuses for it, do you know what I mean? Like, Galway were the better team, they got off to a good start. Look, there's always opportunities if, if we did this or if, if we did that, we could have had a chance, but could have, should have, isn't, isn't any good. It's all about the, 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 top t the team that comes out on top and we weren't good enough on the day and you have to take it on the chin. Your team was one of the most dissected in the media of any of the Irish sports teams over the last two decades because you were trying something different. And um, when it worked, the team got credit. And when there was any kind of kink in it at all whatsoever, the, the hurling cognoscenti were out going, oh, this is ridiculous, can't you? What, what are they trying to do? They're ruining the game. Um, what was it like to be in the inside of that? Again, now I, I, I'm not a huge person. I, 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 today is probably a bit, uh, a, an unusual journey for me in terms of into the media world and things like that. I would have shunned it uh, during my hurling career, and I'm probably not. Well, I'm definitely not a social media man, so I probably would have escaped a lot of that. Obviously, I listen to yourselves an awful lot now. <laughs> were, but, were, were people not saying uh, it to you on the street, though? And were your uh, mates not going, Jesus, what's with this? Um, uh, look, people always do. And, and, like, this is the thing. Like, people always challenge thing, things differently. Like, you know, in fairness, we, we were inside in a, set, in a setup and we enjoyed it. We were very together as a, as a group of players. And people, you'll always have people giving out. Like, you know, when we were, like, when Warford were playing the fantastic hurling in, 
oh seven oh, like of oh, 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 the noughties like people would have said yeah they're fantastic but they concede an awful lot mm. like you know what I mean so I suppose there's two two sides to it I see it at the football at the moment like the people are very critical of it whereas I find it very interesting how you get around this blanket defence and like this is the thing it depends on what you want like like I was at the, the club all Ireland and you know you'd have to like Cor uh, Corofine came out and uh, out on top like but you have to admire um I can't even think of Kilku, uh, 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 the way they went about it. Like, yeah, it's all, look, it, it's Styles not for some, fights. it's not for some, and unfortunately, I'm of the opinion that a lot of people aren't. I like, uh, I, I like winning, and I suppose you do what it takes, which is not for everyone's cup of tea. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. <laughs> This is OTB Sports Radio. Brian O'Driscoll will join us live in studio this Thursday from 3 o'clock. He'll be looking back at the laboured victory over Scotland in the Six Nations opener and what can we expect from Saturday's game against Wales. That's Brian O'Driscoll this Thursday live in studio from 3. Hear it first on OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. Right, Jerry, welcome back. Here's the top five stories that we're covering for you this morning on OTBAM at 11 minutes past eight. Uh, number one, Niall Quinn out doing media yesterday. Number two is CBC. This is the uh, company who are buying into rugby in a big way. They've got a stake in the Pro 14. They've got a stake in the uh, Guinness Premiership. And they're on the verge of sealing a 27% stake in the Six Nations, but they need to get control of the uh, television broadcast deals. That's a sticking point at the moment because the uh, Six Nations want a guarantee that some matches will continue to be on terrestrial TV and we'll see where that goes. Uh, Carl McShane is staying in uh, Tyrone, so he's available. It doesn't look like this, this, is, this is it now. That deal is done. He's never going to Australia. It's not like he's sticking around for this year. He's sticking around for good. That's, Seems, that's the implication. Uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. I think, I think that the door is definitely ajar for Carl McShane if he changes his mind. Messi the City was uh, story number four. Um, this was following on from the story that we covered with Graham Hunter yesterday. Civil war at uh, Camp Now as Eric Abidal uh, has called out the players. Messi was like, who are you talking about? Name names on Instagram, very public. And England, Scotland has turned out to be um, one of the more interesting build-ups to a rugby match that we've seen. Um, we hate you, you hate us is the theme. Yeah, this is uh, Lewis Ludlam who's been uh, talking this week. They hit us and we hit, the, we hit them is the line that you mentioned there. So Eddie Jones came out and, and branded them a niggly side on Tuesday and then promised like a war against Scotland at the weekend. Sometimes you're not sure if these are just kind of like notes that just kind of pop off otherwise mundane quotes. But that is not the case with Lewis Ludlam here. He says... Um, it's a battle, it's going to be a war, and it's something we're excited for and we're ready for. It wasn't a result he wanted against France. We are revved up. We want to be brutal. We don't want to give them an inch to breathe. I'm sure we will see that in the performance at the weekend in all facets of the game, whether it is attack, running at them, picking people, targeting people, or defence, putting people down, sending them backwards, or in the scrum mall and line-out, we're coming for them. Talking like an MMA fighter here. Lewis Little was the guy who had the, the very nice shiner when he came off the bench at the weekend. Uh, he's never set foot in Scotland he says, but right. uh, he hates Scotland, absolutely hates the place. It's a bit like you and Wales. Uh, I've gone through Wales once, I hated every second of it. Uh, lot of them, we are emotionally there, they hate us and we hate them. We are going out at the weekend to get stuck into them. And they are going to do the same to us. So, uh, like, I mean, they're, they're turning up the heat again after, you know, letting that simmer last week and the saucepan blew up in their face. The um, CVC deal, so 300 million quid for a 27% stake and the right for com to commercialise or to exploit the commercial rights of the Six Nations, which means doing all the sponsorship deals and having all the um, bits and bobs, the accoutrements, making money off the back of that, basically, and then also the TV deals. I think everybody has still got a very old-fashioned view of TV deals where... Uh, if, a, if a match is not on terrestrial TV, you're missing this huge mass audience. But is that mass audience genuinely interested? Or is that just the only thing that's on TV at that point? That's important though, isn't it? Is it? Like, how important is it? Like the, the passing fan. Like sport should not just be for the hardcore fans who will pay for your Sky Sports but subscription. Ultimately, how important... Like, what, what, is, what is that pass... What's the, what's the point of somebody who isn't actually genuinely interested, who's just like sitting there, couch potato, flick, 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 I'm going to watch 10 minutes of this, flick, flick. What's the value of that person? Well, like, that's a very intangible thing 
but on paper, like, what, like, are you talking about the wider appeal of the sport? Uh, like, are you, are you talking about, go back are you to the success like, of the Premier League? Like, the Premier League went on Sky and it, it exploded. The, the Darts the Dar- isn't a bad example, right? Because the Darts is this thing that they. What about like, cricket, though? Is, uh, is another example. Talking about cricket, cricket seems to have made a massive comeback in the last 12 months where England got good. England, after years of being crap, got good, and suddenly it's absolutely it's everywhere. So, not good portions of last year's World Cup on free to air. I was watching the World Cup final, and my mum was watching the World Cup final on Channel 4 before we went to watch Kerry Mayo on the Super 8s last year. That is the exact point. Every, people who had no interest in a good uh, portion of sport were suddenly talking about cricket. Of all the, like, it, it had been completely in to the... To what the end? Like, this is the, this is the, the What's point. What's the point then. of that? Like, what, see, this is the question. Like, what... It, what like, are you looking for, like, a stump and bales? Are you looking for, like, I mean, that's getting, getting bats or getting the pads? Are, like, you, are you looking for a spike in participation rates? Are you looking for uh, people conversing about quicker rates? Like, what, what, to what end are you talking about? So, like, what here, are you looking here's for? the thing. What, what boosts participation rates is, is actually... But are you, is that but, what you're looking for, participation what, rates? I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, I'm just let me finish at this point. What boosts participation rates has not been having stuff on TV, generally. If we look at the Olympics, it doesn't, there isn't a, a surge. Always free to air. There isn't a massive surge in people joining. What about their the local women's sports. World Cup last year? We saw that in the well, paper yesterday. So just let me finish, right? Because, well, that's a one-off, and it's specific to a women's sport which has been chronically underfunded for decades and decades and decades. So of course, there's room for those sports to grow. You take athletics. There is not a spike in people actually joining clubs because there's, when when you go and look to try and join a club, there's either no room or there's no coaches. So. Is a sport like rugby well set up to actually increase participation rates, if that's the criteria, by using the 300 million quid to employ a bunch of coaches? Well, I'm asking More you, is that likely. the criteria? Is uh, that the criteria? Well, you're the one who's saying that we need these um, passerby average sports fans who are sitting on their couch, flip, 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 flip. Like, otherwise, they're just empty eyes for the TV stations to sell ads to. Does that not turn into actual people showing up at matches and paying for tickets? Uh, where's the evidence? Like I'm, uh, I, I, like where's the evidence for people showing up to the, the hardcore base showing up to, to cricket matches? Has that gone off the the, the, the face of the earth? The, their attendances at matches. The, I I think that like um, the assumption that because cricket screwed up means everything is also going to screw up. Explain to me how darts got popular on uh, on terrestrial on on with no with one terrestrial TV thing that everybody complains about. It's it's a great it's a great point. Like with darts, it's it's almost. You'd, you'd be scratching your head as to how this happened if you, if you are using other examples. My point is that football will always survive because it is the most important sport in the world. It is the most popular sport in the world. And because the fact that a lot of people actually watch rugby and don't play it means it has this huge... Uh, we have this almost strange love affair with rugby in this country that everybody talks about it, everybody loves the game, and most people haven't picked up a rugby ball. So it's vastly different to football where, like... Basically, every playground in Ireland is, is full of kids kicking a ball around. And bear that's mind, hugely different. They're, they're not, these are not the same things. Bear in mind, if you want to watch any match, like a Six Nations match, it's going to cost you a tenner. Essentially, it'll cost you a tenner and you can get it streamed to your TV. By the time this deal is finished, everybody's going to be able to stream that match onto their TV for a tenner. Are we really saying that that's the end of rugby and that this is, it's such a fragile sport that the investment that the unions are going to get, which they presumably are going to invest in coaching and playing and facilities is, is counterbalanced by the fact that average Joe and Josephine sitting on their couches are not actually watching the game. Well, average Joe and Josephine may actually, after watching a game or two, get caught into the whole nationalistic a- aspect of the Six Nations. And maybe they'll game, pay tenor to get that. game comes to the Viva Stadium, they might actually pay to, to go watch a game. They may, they may be one of the people who are going up, getting pints and not interested in the game, but they are putting money through the IRFU coffers. Maybe you'll say we don't want those people involved in, in the, the game. I won't. We, we're I'm packing out the Aviva Stadium for a sport that a lot of people just haven't played. There's a lot of people in the Aviva Stadium have never picked up a rugby ball and are, are still there. They're still funding money to the organisation that is funding money into the grassroots, which Aviva, I guess is your measurable thing. The Aviva will sell out for rugby be forever because the corporate tickets for, for the games well, the corporate section will always be full later. exactly and that and for the six stations now November internationals may be maybe a different story probably a very different story be interesting be like I, I don't know a lot of the November internationals are behind the paywall now uh, like I, I'd be very interested to see where this is in after five years of being behind the paywall because we're not going to see 
Like, you, it's you, a tenner to get a match. You're, but like it's we're a not, We're not going to see this after one year. Like we're, This could be like a stepping stone. There's talks this morning of potential one game behind the paywall and the rest free to air. That becomes two games the season after and three games. Yeah. And then, then eventually it becomes well, all behind be, the paywall. There'll be one game every I, weekend which will be free to air. I would be very interested in, in where the sport goes after five years of the Six Nations, and which basically is the last bit of rugby free to air, when, when that goes behind the paywall. Like, I, I'd be very interested when the whole sport... But they're not going to put everything. Now, they're not gonna, they're, oh, it's view. unlikely they're going to put everything. There'll be one game every weekend. Now, it might be Ireland France, or it might be Ireland Italy, and not everybody's going to tune into that. But there'll be highlights programmes, and anybody who's interested in it, who's a genuine, who has a genuine interest the, in it... The genuine fans are not going to be affected by this. No, no question about we'll that. We'll spend a tenner. I, and and ca casual with, like, people, people will more than happily spend a tenner to watch a sports event in the comfort of their home if the game is big enough. And also, like this may play into your point of view, uh, th there is a huge pub culture around the Six Nations. Like, yeah, that obviously yeah. doesn't get affected by this, but yeah. no. I, I put value on Josephine and Joseph that we that be, have become now famous. Yeah, uh, whoever they are. I just, I, what we need to do is define how important those people are, because ultimately we're, we're deciding public policy on the basis of like people who don't really give a shit about sport, who just want to sit and, and be entertained for nothing at, at home. The question is, it's going to happen. Like, the home nations want to well, they, uh, remove... Uh, they, they're against the idea of it becoming completely immune from pay-per-view. Yeah, uh, they are, but they also want to make sure that some of it is on free to air. So, um, look, we'll come back to this. 21 minutes past eight this morning. Shot clock is next. First, after his big win at the weekend, off the ball, caught up with Graham McDowell. My favourite superhero would be uh, Batman, of course. Uh, he's got all the toys, he's got all the cars, and... Uh, Gets the girls too. That was awesome. Superpower, uh, you know, I guess Sullyport session would be great. You know, uh, we travel a lot on the golf tour. If I could uh, get myself to Asia or Australia or somewhere in the world in an instant, that would, uh, that would save some time. Tattoos, no, uh, uh, no tattoos. Uh, definitely not in the near future either. I'm not a, not a tattoo kind of guy. My biggest fear, uh, I don't know, uh, probably snakes, alligators, spiders, yikes. Biggest weakness, uh, probably a cold beer. I just can't resist them. Uh, you're very welcome along to this morning's Shot Clock, where we've got the big full forward, Kieran Donaghy, taking on uh, the full back, Ger Gilroy, this morning as ever. Three topics of debate changing up the scoring of the debate a little bit this morning. Uh, if you make a positive point, you will hear this sound. And if you make a really crap argument, you're going to hear this sound. So the scoring should get interesting a little bit later on. We've got three topics of debate, then we'll get into Kieran's free throw, and then into the picks, and we'll have last week's scores from the picks as well. If you've got any forfeit for the lads, whoever loses in the picks or the debates this year, tweet us at Off The Ball. Andrew McLaughlin last week was suggesting that the lads do some commentary topless, uh, whoever loses, which I think is a fantastic shout. Right, let's get into topic number one, which is around the idea of judging people by the amount of, in, of medals they've won. So Michael Brick Walsh, who is uh, here on the screen beside me, obviously hasn't got an All-Ireland medal. Are we judging his career by the fact that he's never won Liam McCarthy. Sure. We in Irish sport place far too much store in the fact that you have to have got over the line to become uh, a great. Now, so at the moment, everybody talks about Michael Brick Walsh as being one of the great hurlers of his generation, but in time, that's going to fade. The same way it did with Johnny Doyle, for example. No one talks about Johnny Doyle as one of the best footballers of the last 20 years, when clearly he was absolutely, at his peak, one of the best footballers over the last 20 years. But he gets completely forgotten about because... Kildare didn't get over the line in 2010. Similarly, uh, several of his um, several of his teammates were uh, similarly talented and are out of the conversation. It's just a stupid part about Irish sport where we we me measure things exclusively in medals. Kieran, yeah, uh, I kind of agree. It's like this, the simple answer is medals should not define your career. I think there's moments that happen in, in Michael Brick Walsh's career, John Milan. There's a host of players from different sports that have iconic moments that will be always remembered by them, their fans, their family members, uh, which will make them a legend in their own right in that, in that town, county, team, province, whatever it is. Having an All-Ireland medal, having a national championship, whether it's the NBA or Super Bowl or anything like that, should not define your career. There's great players. You look at the NBA, you look at the Charles Barkley, the Patrick Ewings. Are you going to tell me that their career is not defined by them having not have a, a, a national championship, an NBA championship ring or a Super Bowl? They're absolute legends in their own right. It's a, it's a very tricky one because 
when these players look back, like you do everything to win in All Ireland, obviously as a player, it's what it's all about, and that's all you think about when you're playing. But I, for for me, and certainly when you get to the end, end, end of your career and you start looking at things retrospectively, you start looking at the training sessions, the memories, the time spent, the teammates, the friendships, the bonds made. That's actually more important. But when you're a young guy and you're in the squad, all you can think about is that ultimate goal. And I think if players don't reach that ultimate goal, they will feel right then and there that it's not a success. But in time, they'll look back and they'll be happy with their Would goal. you have felt unfulfilled, though, if so? the first year you come in, you win Football of the Year, you win All-Ireland, and you go back to back, I think. So if you hadn't won any more than those two, at the end, would you have felt that you didn't fulfill your potential because you only had two All-Irelands? Yeah, but that's, I think I would have, and I think that's because of the team I was on. So I was very lucky to be from a county like Kerry that was very competitive, that had an unbelievable team. But if I, if Kieran Donnelly was playing with a lesser team, people wouldn't necessarily have heard of me. I mightn't have won all Ireland's, but that should not have defined what I was about. The way I played the game, whether I played with Kerry or somebody else, the fact that I was playing with Kerry helped me win all Ireland's. Should that make me any better than guys that played with lesser counties that were much better footballers of me? I don't think so. I think there's the Matty Fords, there's, there's countless guys that, that, that maybe didn't get over the line and win all Ireland that were absolutely unbelievable players and legends in their own right and not having a medal shouldn't define them. You make the point about um, Barkley and a couple of the others. Uh, the thing about the NBA is that we can specifically register exactly how well those teams did because we have stats that back up the quality of the performance, their shooting percentage, all that kind of stuff. We need to get to a point where Johnny Doyle's performances are, are like their standout. They were so sensational. He carried the team and his leaping ability, all that kind of stuff. We need to just be able to quantify things a bit more in Irish sport, I suspect, as opposed to just the eye test. That lad had a good game today. Yeah, but it's a bit trickier in Irish sport because guys in the NBA, the Barclays, uh, they could move, they could transfer, they could go to the Rockets and try and win a championship. They could go here to try and win a championship. Johnny Doyle started with Kildare, played 20 years, an absolutely unbelievable career. Uh, and that's not, he didn't have the option to jump on board with somebody else that was more competitive to give himself a chance to win that championship. So it's a bit different. You look at the Premiership, you look at a guy like Gerard, played an unbelievable career, never got there. Um, if he'd have signed for Chelsea that time, he would have ended up with four Premierships. He would have ended up with. Me that myself. Stevie G, not as good as Kenny Dog Leash because he couldn't drag the team over the line. Yeah, but he slipped. That's probably <laughs> exactly. <what> cost him. <laughs> he slipped over the line, which probably what cost him in the end. But it should not define him because if he'd have gone to Chelsea or somebody like that, he would have won the leagues at that time. But I think his iconic status is even more so the fact that he stayed and he stayed with the cause and he tried to win it and he just didn't get over the line. But he will be always remembered as an absolute icon in Liverpool. I think in ten years' time he's going to come down as the recency bias uh, changes. That this team of, of players who actually have started to win things with Liverpool. I think they're going to, although he did obviously win a Champions League, so maybe yeah, it's fair. Uh, not that he win a Champions League, he actually put them on his back for about 10 minutes, like, like Roy Keane did out in Juventus. Yeah, uh, I, I, that, that is a lot of hot takes coming in there. We're nip and tuck so far, we'll get to the scores at the very end. We're moving on to rugby. Is this weekend last chance saloon for some of the owl lads for Ireland? Of course, they got hammered by Wales last year. If they got hammered again this year, do we just accept that we're entering a period of transition that we're not able to challenge for a championship right now? Kieran, you can lead us off on this one. Yeah, I think, you know, I think in Ireland, uh, as Joe rightly said earlier on about GA and, and, and championships, I think here we're also obsessed about retiring fellas as soon as they get to 30, or they're not good enough, or they're old, or they're over the line. I had it for the last four or five years of my career. I think the average age of the Irish squad currently is 26 and a half years. Four out of the six Six Nations team have an average age of 26 years old. We're not old. We're, we're, we're the exact same as four of the other teams. You look at some of our starlets coming up, Robbie Henshaw, Jordan Lammer, 22, Henshaw, 26. Uh, we've got loads of players in that, other, that under bracket. Um, yeah, you have your guys that are older. You have your Sexton, who's obviously uh, an unbelievable leader, and he will continue to lead the team as a 34-year-old. Um, but you have Conor Murray behind him who's 30, Peter Armani he's still 29. All of these fellas are talked about because Ireland's form isn't great at the moment. We start looking at the easy thing. The easy thing is a few of these guys are older, oh let's push them on, let's bring in some of the younger guys. Are the younger guys actually better players than these guys? I don't think so. You stick with your guys, you find out a way to get your farm back, you find out a way to get your players playing better. That's up to Farrell and the management team. Stop looking for the easy option and start pointing at these fellas are over the hill. It's like the same old story when a team loses in All-Ireland, loses a big game, they were tired, they were overtrained. All the simple, easy excuses that people pick when they're not actually the truth. The fact is the team didn't perform in the day, the other team were better, and that's what's happened to Ireland over the last few games. They're going to have to find a way to dig themselves out of it. Oof.
argue against that? Well, a, a couple of things. Um, the best thing that happened to the Owlads in the Ireland team at the moment was the fact that the World Cup draw is going to be made this November and so every single match counts for World Cup seeding in the next four years. This, suddenly, we're actually on a four-year cycle it, and we should not be on a four-year cycle. It's far too early for us to be thinking about that. So the Owlads should have one more stay of execution and it is this Six Nations and it is unfortunately going to end up being this November. But if, for example, Joey Carby had been fit, wouldn't we all be crying out for Joey Carby to be starting at out half? Look at what France did. They put a 20-year-old in at out half against England and they won. This guy is now going to be the absolute future of that team because he was given his head, a 23-year-old scrum half. And a, what a halfback partnership that in four years' time is going to be at their absolute peak. The French can build for a four-year cycle. I totally understand that because they are going to be hosting the World Cup and they need to get players in. We don't have a playing pool that big. But at the same time, if, if we weren't fighting for World Cup qualifying points, then this game for Peter O'Mahony this week and next week, we're going to be absolutely massive because he has to remind everybody that he's as good now as he was when he was captain in the Lions 18 months ago. Yeah. Like, but but last should, like, chance saloon, but I think should we're pretty close six unbelievable saloon. years that Peter O'Mahony has been put in, let's call it fate, spade a spade. He's been unbelievable for the last six, seven years. The last few games or the last year, he hasn't been at that peak. Are we writing off what he's done? Like the, four, the World Cup is 2023. It's a long, long-term goal. We've we've, a, we've a, three more Six Nations to go. We've a Lions tour to go. They've 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 so much to play for in between. Then I think you can certainly get guys in here or there. But you have to stay with your best guys. Your best guys are the guys that'll that'll be on the field to win the game on Sunday. That's what Andy Farrell's picking. He can't pick guys because of a four-year thing that's happening that far away. 2023 is too far away. You pick your team, the best team to go and win in on um, Saturday. Right, OK. There is, uh, I can tell you in the negative points, it's 3-1 against Kieran at the moment. So Jerry's talking a little less shite at the moment, but Kieran <laughs> might have a few more uh, positive points to his name. We'll tally them up very shortly. This is a photograph of Andy Moran. Billy Joe Padden was on off the ball on Monday night. He was talking about how Mayo footballers, if they're exceptionally gifted, tend to get brought away from the goal so they can get involved in more play. Are inside forwards born, not made is the question. Andy Moran is one of the few who managed to slip through those cracks and managed to make it as an inside forward. Ger, do you want to start us off on this one? Yeah, so this is uh, essentially the fact that the big and best and most successful counties in Ireland know that when you have a superstar, you stick him in the inside forward line. You think back to DJ Carey, you think back to Henry Sheffin, they didn't turn them into centre forwards, they didn't turn them into left half backs, they didn't say, oh, you need to go back there and see what the ball is going to be like going into the full forward line. They, they're like, you need to learn how to be tough, you need to learn how to win your own ball, you need to learn how to be at the end of a scoring move, and you need to be greedy. You need to develop a little bit of ego and actually turn into somebody who, when, when the game is on the line, we're going to go, it's your job to get us out of this. That's exactly why those counties, like Gooch, Gooch was never a centre forward, really. Mm -hmm. At the end, maybe. <laughs> that was a bad comparison there, though. Inside forwards are, are, you can say that inside forwards are He was just a corner forward the entire time. When he was at his absolute peak, he was 100%. Shut up. <laughs> he was a corner forward. He was a corner forward. And people say he was a born corner forward. Morris Gooch, Fitz. Gooch, they were not born corner forwards. Morris Fitz was started as a half forward. He wasn't born a corner forward. Corner forwards are born because they go away and they're actually put the effort into their game. They're actually made. Corner forwards are made. The Peter Canavans, the Stevie McDonalds, the Cullum Coopers are made. Why are they made? Because they put in more effort than anybody else when they were young. They practiced harder when they were young. They were the go-to guys to. And that's important to tell kids that because kids can't look at a Cullum Cooper or Peter Canavan and go, oh, these fellas are just born inside forwards. Every inside forward is actually made. You look at Bernard Brogham when he came on the scene, was a wing forward, and all of a sudden he was... A, the main corner forward on a team that won a five in a row. So that that's the whole thing about being born is, is, is just an easy thing to say. People are born to play the game is, is too easy to say. It's important to tell kids, to tell people that you can be that guy if you put in the effort. Cullum Cooper was the guy that was out kicking the ball every single day. He wasn't born to be a corner forward for Kerry. I think it's 80% that you're made and about 20% of it is you're born. And that's just athletic genetics that gets you to the point where you can make it to the elite level. That's the only thing I'd say. Look, I agree. 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. I absolutely 100% agree with that. But the point here is that uh, Mayo have for too long took their best players and stuck them in at half forward, stuck them in the midfield, stuck them in the half back line because they're, they want their half backs to be the players. Kerry and Kilkenny and Cork, when they see somebody who has talent, they're like, okay, absolutely, you're going to have to do the work, but you're going to be an inside forward because that's where you can do the most damage. For example, if Donegal had turned Michael Murphy into exclusively an inside forward and the entire entire county's 
reason for existence had been to get the ball to him in the full forward line, I suspect they would have won more All-Irelands than they've won. That, I think the Michael Murphy point just sums, sums it up. And plus, Ger, you're thinking you're talking about football 20 years ago, 10 years ago versus football today. It's not as easy as just stick your guy inside. It's The last few years, it's very easy to say stick your guy inside and he's back with a blanket defence around him. He can't get any ball. Course teams had to look at getting their players out the pitch. But that's a different thing to players be either being born to be a corner forward, an inside forward or not. Conor McManus started as a half-back at Monaghan. This is, this is the disease that afflicts all of Gaelic football. Andy Moore was playing out the field when he, when he started. The, the, put your best players close to goal and tell them your job is to score, your job is to learn how to deal, get the guile to get a bit of space, get a bit of separation from the, uh, the blanket defence. Your job is to be the killer on our team. Everybody's like, oh no, we're going to be a nice little halfback, I'm going to run onto the ball and a bit of space is going to be easy for me to be showy. It's hard, it's very Point hard to be Andy Moran. I think, I think McManus, the example of McManus is, is exactly my point about inside forwards are actually made more so than the barn because McManus was obviously a solid enough forward when he was coming on the scene, but McManus is a guy who actually went and put in the hours and hours to be great. That's what he is now. He wasn't great when he came on the scene because if he was, he wouldn't have come on at half-back. He would have been juggernauted straight into corner forward. They weren't exactly born with loads of forwards at that time, but I think he's a prime example of a guy that was made by himself in the lab. All right, give him one more point there. I'm going to tell you he's up during the free throw. The free throw here is about Another Irish basketball. Fix. <laughs> do, you want, do, you want to, do you want to have one more? One more no, effort? No, 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 off you go, go on. But like, I mean, that, the, the Gooch rampage on him not being a centre forward could be the thing that costs you. I will top them up in just a moment. <laughs> Irish basketball obviously been a big week, Kieran. They've come out uh, complaining, and I think a lot of people will get behind their complaints about not getting the funding when they badly needed it, especially when you look at what happened to the FAI this year. Let's look at this in the context of what's happened internationally for Ireland. I think it's fair to say that some of the international teams have underachieved, but that's because they've come from a place of not even having an international team due to some of the funding issues. What's your take on all of this? Yeah, look, uh, you know, the statement by uh, released by Basketball Ireland, you know, it had to be done. Uh, firstly, I want to say, uh, like, like everybody, I think, in the country, especially in Basketball Ireland, nobody wanted to see the FAI hung out to dry or go to the wall. That's obvious. Football in this country is just too important. It's a fabric of, of a lot of parts of the country, so you couldn't let something like that happen. Um, I think people are looking at this in Basketball Ireland as, 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 as unfair. They're right to say that. Granted, it was a different time. It was back in the recession of <clears throat> 2009. But for people in Basketball Ireland to be told when they had their mishaps, and their mishaps was the funding that they got, they were supposed to put it into buying stuff, getting um, venues up to scratch. They were putting it back into Irish teams to allow teams to be ap actually able to play at the highest level. That was their punishment. Their punishment was they had to pay back 1.5 million, their, their money to build a national stadium out in Tala to, to develop it more, improve it. That money was taken off them a half a million, which was a huge blow to them at the time. I was on an Irish team when I was 15. My mother had to raise a thousand pounds for me. She sold lines in the hospital as a nurse. I'm sure she had all the nurses and doctors broke up inside there selling lines. I was walking around the towns, <coughs> excuse me, getting out, getting out to people, getting out to everybody in my estates, trying to raise the money to get on this, the plane. And it was a real thing that if I didn't raise that money, I wouldn't have been able to play for that Irish team. I was the captain of the team, but if I didn't raise the money, I wouldn't have been able to be going. That's back in 98. So Basketball Ireland has been grossly underfunded, not in the last 10 years, but I would say in the last 30 or 40 years. The, the sport was massive in the 80s. It was great. It was on national TV, but still underfunded at the time. Everybody, the, the league was going so well because they funded it themselves. I think Kieran Shannon wrote a great piece yesterday. It's the third largest sport played in Ireland, participation-wise. It's number one in P schools in Ireland. Um, the new government, and when the new government comes in and looks at this, we have to support basketball as a sport in Ireland more. It gets nothing. That's the facts of it. It really gets so little on the ladder. You know, it's up to us in News Talk, and we've done a great job over the last year promoting the game inside here. But everybody has to promote the game. The games, the score lines of the Super League teams have to be called out. Irish teams, and he wrote a great piece about, about um, Clare Rockall, um, that Irish team that were, came along the scene. Their team was pulled from underneath them. Just when they were coming to the stage where colleges could have been looking at them, it was a huge time in their careers. And Basketball Ireland had to fold everything. They had to re uh, double registrations. They had to find out a way to win money themselves, or to get money themselves, to keep the actual sport going. And that's why I think it's grossly unfair. Can they do anything about that? No. No. But the new government coming in can have a look at this and say, OK, Basketball Ireland took it on the chin badly, took a big knock. If it was a heavyweight fight, he would have been reeling, maybe falling down, maybe getting 
getting an A count, but they got back up. They've got the game back in a great place. It's a brilliant game for boys and girls to play. I can't. Uh, I, I had my own daughter Lola Rose down to the St Brendan's Academy the last day, four and a half, about 40 kids inside in the hall. Such a great game, can always be played during the winter months, but we have to hope that the new government get on board, learn from the mistakes of the last government about the lack of funding, the lack of support that goes into it. The Irish team staying in hostels, having to pay for themselves, staying in people's houses. I stayed in Joy Boylan's house, my great coach at the time. He got his pizzas every night. That was one part of it. But kids now have to go up, they're staying. Seven or eight kids are staying in people's houses. Uh, I think someone coming back in Kieran's article yesterday, someone's coming back and they tatted it up that it cost maybe 10 to 12 grand, not only to send their kid to an under 15 Irish team, but to go and watch them when they actually made the tournament. That's not on teams, that, Irish teams, if you're representing your country, you should be funded. Well said. Uh, I think that concludes the free throw for this week. Back to uh, the shot clock again and the scores. Are in. You're not going to believe this. I thought it was uh, a tie at one moment, but actually there has been a winner by just one point. Jer, you scored seven points this week. You made uh, 13 positive points, but you scored six in the negative column, most of which came from that Scooch argument. Let's oh, uh, call it a spade, a spade here. Oh, shit. Uh, Kieran, you finished with eight. So uh, Kieran takes uh, the debate trophy home this week. You, you didn't score as many positive points as Ger, but you scored two less negative points. And even so even though we didn't have the points last week, I was still, you I did, still you won did, last you week did, as well. He started forward for like a wet week at the end of his career. You did he started Leary's game, he started corner forward. He killed him. He was at absolute peak as a corner forward. I will say this, Kieran. You, you, did, you did put Robbie Henshaw into the coming up bracket, the, the, one 26. of those young ones to watch. He's 26. Robbie Henshaw, so you, you, you lost points on that. Right, on to the picks. Last week's uh, results from this, it was two all in this last week, so we're going to give you uh, one point if you get the correct outcome, and then three points if you manage to get the correct scoreline or margin of victory. Jer, you picked the Chiefs, you got the point for that, Kieran, you picked the 49ers. Uh, Jer and Kieran both predicted Ireland to win, none, none of them got the correct scoreline, and then Jer, you picked Mayo to beat Dublin by a point, which didn't happen, Kieran, you picked Dublin by three. So two all from the picks last week. This week, as we can see, Ireland against Wales. Kieran, who have you got? Um, I've got uh, Wales, uh, unfortunately. I think they're just uh, in a better place at the moment. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if Ireland nicked this one in a real tight game, but uh, if I was to put my bet in and these um, punishments that are coming for myself for Jar, if we if we lose this at the end of the, the National League, I think is the first call. So I will go uh, safe and go with Wales by uh, between four and seven. Give us an exact number. Uh, 29, 23. Sure. Uh, Wales are going to win by three points and the score, I didn't have a correct score for this one, but I'm going to go with 16-13. Um, uh, Game of the weekend in the Allianz Football League is Donegal against Galway. Ger, who, who do you think is going to win this? This is a good question. Where is it? Letterkenny. Okay, Donegal. Yeah, Letterkenny. I'm actually going to go with Galway. Um, I think Galway will, should have won against Kerry last week. Um, I think they have more impetus under their, a new manager to, to prove uh, what happened last week was, was a bit of bad luck for, on their point of view. They, they should have been comfortable, they should have seen out the game, they made a few mistakes late and you can't make mistakes against Kerry and Tralee with that crowd behind them. And I think Galway are going to go up with a point to prove this weekend and be a bit more desperate than Donegal. Is this uh, the battle to see who's actually number three and four? I would have thought so. so yeah. in, your, in your power rankings, they, they can win the, the bronze medal this weekend. It's all in the line. The own power Kenny. rankings. Uh, this man, Odi Nagala, we don't have a third match to look ahead to this weekend, so we're going to choose how many goals Odi Nagala is going to score between now and the end of the season, over or under 4.5 goals, Kieran. Uh, I think he'll be over. I think he'll. I think he'll actually get about six or seven, um, just because. He probably, uh, like everybody that scores, uh, everybody scores in their debut, so he's going to score in his debut. Get on that bet, firstly, uh, and I think he's going to get a few more between, between now and the end of the season. Sure. So I'd say over. I'm going under. I'm going under. I don't think that uh, he's going to see as much game time as everybody thinks. I think that um, the notion that somehow he's going to fit seamlessly into this Man United team, having just come back from China, where, uh, fair, fair enough, he's banging in the goals, but like... Um, Nobody fits up front for this United team, really, Barham at Rashford, so... That's the thing. I don't... I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm taking the under yeah, on this one. I just, I just think he'll get it because I think actually if they went away and spent 100 million as a great striker, he's a fellow who mightn't get four and a half goals because that's the way it's worked out for United over the last number of years. So I think taking a punt in this lad is, is going to work. All right, good stuff, lads. More from the shot clock. Same time, same place. Next week it is Thursday mornings, OTBAM. Check out youtube.com 
forward slash off the ball and tweet us at off the ball for any topics you have and again some suggestions for the forfeit for the loser of the debate and the picks at the end of the season although I'm, I'm having Andrew McLaughlin's suggestion of topless commentating right here in a second with us Tom Malone is up next here is Niall Quinn talking about the Basketball Ireland uh, statement this week my first reaction was uh, my two nieces played for Ireland I used to love coming back to Tala to watch them play I like basketball I'm, I'm you know, uh, I, I played it once and got sent off in a schools match, so that was the end of it for me. I reached six fouls in five minutes, and the Christian brother didn't speak to me for about two years. So that's my basketball experience. But uh, in truth to you, I, I believe it's not a contest, and I believe basketball ourselves, uh, all the other sports that are doing great things in this country, should come together and have a lobby to get even more funding. I, I absolutely believe basketball should get more money, and I know they got treated very harshly uh, way back when when the Troika were in town. You know, it was a different landscape then. You know, the country was on its knees when all that happened but I would be the first one to support anything they would uh, put in place to, to uh, you know drive for more funding I would do it for all sports there is no more and as far as I'm concerned as I'm the association there's no more us and them I believe all our sports should have a forum we should get together we should power home the uh, the ability and the value of all sports in this country and get a better deal from government all round. So, you know, if, if Brenda wants to come and see how we did things or somebody else is doing stuff, that we could all share our knowledge and come at the political leaders who are talking a great game at the moment and, and we, were, we were fortunate to, 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 to get uh, support in this time. Uh, but, at, you know, at the same time, th there's far more to be, uh, to be understood about sport and to be gained by government support. And if Basketball Ireland get... Uh, big increase in funding, they'll get a pat on the back from me. Well done, you deserve it. That's uh, Nal Quinn diffusing the row uh, with Basketball Ireland. Uh, right. Yeah, let's start with football. Hyung min Sung scored a late penalty to send Spurs into the fifth round of the FA Cup last night. But Jose Mourinho's side are made to work against Southampton. It finished 3-2 at the new White Hart Lane. Shane Long scored the first goal for the Saints. And Danny Ings gave the Saints a 2-1 lead with 20 minutes left to play. Lucas Moore levelled things up with just 12 minutes left on the clock before Sun earned a penalty four minutes from time before converting himself. Tottenham do have some striking issues, though, without Harry Kane. Mourinho is hoping the team can cope with this like a shortage. I don't know when uh, Lucas and Son they are going to finish the the fuel. I don't know. So it's very difficult to progress the way we would like to to progress. It's more like let's build a team to give us a chance to compete in the next match. Meanwhile, Celtic remain seven points clear at the top of the Scottish Premiership after a 4-0 win away to Motherwell last night. Second place, Rangers kept the pressure on with a 2-1 win at home to Hibernian. To stay in touch, Romanian Yanis Haji scored the winner in his first start for Rangers and day his dad, Georgie Haji, turned 55. It was a big day for birthdays yesterday in the football world. Uh, we had uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. There was actually a whole hatful as well. Uh, Sven Jorn Eriksson. Yanis uh, as well, actually, just off the top of my head. But right. we, I and think we ended up with at least... Seven That'd footballers are going to come down with me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah absolutely. We know what Manchester United midfielder Scott McTominay says there's a good atmosphere around the club following the January transfer window. Bruno Hernandez and Paycut accepting Nigerian international uh, Idion Igalo arrived at Old Trafford to boost Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's side. McTominay told Sky Sports News earlier that the new arrivals have fitted in well. First and foremost, the good people, and that's what we need at this football club. We need people who are good, good friends. Obviously, can go out for dinner with everybody as well, and then what they bring onto the pitches, we've seen that, and hopefully they can bring a lot for us. But first impressions are, are very, very good. In Gaelic games, it was good news for Tyrone last night as uh, senior footballer Colin McShane will be available for the rest of the league campaign and the championship this summer. The All-Star forward was set to move down under to play Aussie rules but will now stay in Ireland. The Adelaide Crows confirmed that in a statement McShane had decided not to make, to make the move after a 10-day trial with the AFL club last month. While in rugby, Ireland continued their build-up to Saturday's Six Nations clash with Wales in Dublin. It's been reported that Gary Ringrose and Andrew Conway could be in line for new deals to stay in Ireland after James Ryan penned a three-year central contract with the IRFU yesterday. While Charlie Ewells has been dropped from England's rugby union squad for Saturday's Six Nations clash with Scotland, the bad second row started last weekend's opening defeat in Paris. Head coach Eddie Jones is already without Manu Tualangi and Andrew Watson and will name his team this morning for that match at Murrayfield. Flanker Louis Ludum tell, told Sky Sports News earlier they're prepared for a feisty encounter at Murrayfield. They don't like us, we don't like them, and it's going to be a battle at the weekend. And um, I'm sure after the results of the weekend, both teams are going to come out fighting, both teams have got something to prove. 
You like to hear that, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to hear that before an England Scotland needle. game. Yeah. yeah. And fresh from his win at the Saudi International, Graham McDowell is in the field for the Pebble Beach Pro, which gets underway later. Uh, Seamus Perrin, Porrick Harrington, also in action in California. McDowell is also on his say on the Welcome to the Distance Insights Project, uh, a joint initiative by the USGA and the RNA to study the past, present and future impacts of distance in golf. McDowell worried about the impact of the game historically, including questioning the necessity to lengthen historic holes like the 17th at St Andrews and the 13th at Augusta. So overall, a pretty cerebral take on things. Dustin Johnson, meanwhile, former world number one and one of the longest hitters in the game, also had his say, bang on brand. He spoke to the Golf Channel's uh, Randall Mel. Actually, you see the tweet up on the screens right now. Yeah. <laughs> so he saw the email, saw how long it was, didn't read it. Bang on brand. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Boy DJ. Boy <laughs> DJ, yeah. So one of the biggest hitters in the game, one of the people this report should impact potentially the most. No, I didn't read the email. <clears throat> and finally in darts, the Premier League season gets underway tonight in Aberdeen. Highlight, of course, the repeat of this year's world final. Michael van Gerwen faces newly crowned world champion Peter Snakebite Wright. Also with the hockey, Derry's Daryl Gurney is up against Gary Anderson and Gerwen Price takes on former champion Rob Cross. You going to Aberdeen, Jer? Can't yeah. wait, Tom. Yes, yeah, DJ I probably won't care really about the golf balls because sure, if they're made, everybody else is going to go backwards as well. He's yeah, still the biggest and exactly, most powerful. Yeah, but he's like, so he's, he's like yeah. He's like six foot five, he can the get courses. it. It's not about who's hitting it longer, it's just the courses are like St Andrews is becoming. You know, if it's if it's so the Andrews with no wind is not is a test for a no, professional golfer anymore. No. Um, the lads were talking about this earlier, and they said that uh, it's a lot of it has to do with physicality of the players. They're actually yeah. stronger, so that's one of the. It's not just the equipment because yeah. everybody's playing with the same balls and the same yeah. equipment. So if you look at also if you look at Dustin Johnson physically, he can get to the top of his swing. The way he can turn his wrists round means the club can kind of get to almost that angle at the top of his swing. So plus he's like six foot five. So yeah. when you get that and core club speed and accuracy flowing through the ball, it's like a monstrous whip. Yeah, but you so. see even like guys like McElroy who aren't massive in stature but they're just strong, their core is strong, the speed they're getting through the ball, it's yeah. Yeah. You see his workout Crazy. videos he pops on Instagram and yeah. stuff like that. He is incredibly strong. Yeah. All right, good stuff, Tom. Thanks for that. We're previewing the weekend's getting football next here on OTBM with Kieran Owen's going to be back in the studio as well. Uh, what changes though would players and managers in women's football like to see in the coming years? Here's MT asking a collection of intercounty stars and coaches. Have a look. Gosh, uh, well, I know they are doing a very good job at the minute, but I think I would really enforce the whole notion of well-being in the clubs now, and especially with the county teams as well. Definitely put more supports in place for that. And you know, if you were, if uh, you did have three magic wishes, you know, obviously, you know, with more funding, I think you could really roll out the the well-being and, and make sure that everyone had sort of access to a peer within their own county that they could have support from as well. Um, obviously the numbers have grown um, at games, but I would say that maybe just give everybody um, extra free tickets to make sure that the, the stadium was full running out. As I say, obviously it's an amazing um, number already what we have going to the Orange Finals, but it just must be a bit extra special for the lads when they're running out and the pitch is full. I think it's about getting better coverage for the games that have been going on in the league and the championship, you know, it's all right getting it for the all Ireland final. And I know they are trying to promote the game a lot better, but for me personally, I'd love to see bigger crowds at every game. Um, I would probably, oh, um, I suppose from the Camogie and football side of things, there's a lot of clashes. So I suppose if I could work something out there that they're, like the girls would be encouraged to be able to play both codes with no clashes, that would be something that I'd probably look at doing. Easier said than done though. I might look at um, maybe getting teams into to Crow Park a bit before the, the All Ireland final, which they have started doing. So, um, I suppose that one of one of the first things is kind of just get a bit more, a bit more for the players, like you know maybe expenses, travel expenses possibly, um, just kind of you know a bit more fairness between men's and women's football. Um, I wouldn't necessarily throw anything out. I think it's all going well. <laughs> A lot of girls are going to Australia at the minute and maybe if they had more to kind of incline them to stay home here in Ireland, um, that's probably something that I might focus on. And probably in general, I suppose, local ladies footballers in general are kind of crying out for expense and stuff like that and probably that's something that I'd probably focus in on really. Yeah, bring the association immediately across the road and join forces with the men. Well, funnily enough, that's going to be exactly my next question, which is do you think are they better off in or out and why? This whole, um, you know, twinning up of games and double headers and that, you know, trying to put it on somewhat of an equal footing, and we use the term fair rather than equal or fair, you know, equality. 
Uh, but I don't ever see the day that this is going to work unless it's under the same umbrella. I clear up the inconsistency with the with the um, contact the tackle. I think it's just you know some refs are very lenient on it more or not, and I suppose that's just frustrating for us. Mark Tosin Kelly there with a collection of players and managers uh, ahead of the start of the LGFA season. Properly talk about the changes that they'd like to see to the game. Now let's turn our attention back to uh, Gaelic football. A big story breaking overnight is that Carl McShane is staying at home. This obviously changes where Tyrone sit within the landscape. It completely transforms Tyrone from being we were talking about them as also rans like. Maybe the fifth or sixth or seventh best team in the country to they got they got belief back now. Yeah, they do, and uh, and so they should. If you think back to the to the game against Kerry in the All Ireland semi final last year, like they were, it didn't look good for Kerry at half time in that game. McShane was killing him, killing them, and we were we weren't functioning well, and, and that can happen against Tyrone because they do they're good at getting bodies back and they're good at playing that health defense, which makes it hard for individuals to really shine. Um, I think Tommy made a big difference when he came on that day, Tommy Walsh. Uh, but like, rightly so, they, they should be saying, no, OK, let's go. Kyle Coney's playing good football for them. He's a, he's a, he's a kind of plus outside there. Um, and look, McShane, you just put him straight back in at 14 and all of a sudden you've got a great focal point. They're also saying the mark is in this year. Yeah. <coughs> we thought we were going to lose him to Australia. Let's, let's use him for why maybe they looked at getting him down there because he's so good at getting out in front. Um, and look, we argued about it on shot clock last week. But if the rule stays the same, it doesn't need it. Doesn't have to be up here. It doesn't have to be the skyscraper of a catch, which is what we were kind of hoping it would be for. It's about getting out in front and having good kickers out the field. And they have Coney and McCurry. They have good kickers that can deliver a good ball out there. So they will be, they will be rightly delighted and 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 rightly so feel like they're back in the race to be contenders. Before the news broke that he's staying around. Um, we were like, they're going to have to rush Matty Donnelly back from the hamstring he ripped off the bone. That's going to be their main attacking thrust. They were trying stuff with um, Ed McGinley on. I was saying, he was like, look, you know, they're trying stuff, but the lads that they're trying it with just aren't Kyle McShane level. And no one can expect him to be because he was the best full forward in the country last year. So it's a transformative moment for them that... Can they can they get close to Dublin? Like, is this is there any way that they can, like, realistically feel like... Now with McShane back in the team, what what can they do over the next four months to go into the championship season? Going, look, we've got to crack this year. I think you use your, your, your I think you use your best guy and figure out what's the best way to use him. And you know, Dublin have good players in the full back line, but I still think McShane on his day gives anybody huge problems. So if they can if they can find a way to get good ball into him, um, he's an excellent kicker. If they if he can get if he can get two or three marks a game, it's an automatic three points. If he can get a few dangerous balls where he gets them on the bounce and he can go take. He's very good at taking on his men. He's powerful. So you figure out one how to get. Look, Donnelly's a big one. You know, you need Donnelly going well. How well he comes back from that injury? Do they try and tailor his role? Do they say, okay, maybe he's lost a, maybe a bit of his explosiveness? Do you put him to the middle of the field? Like Matty Donnelly, would be unbelievable yeah. in the middle of the field as a good tracker, good tackler, smart guy. He knows where to be. Can carry the ball at the pitch. Yeah, he mightn't be ha able to have that explosiveness where he's going to leave people for dead and kick points but he can still kick points in the loop, he can still come on late and kick points. He is an inspirational player for them, so how they tweak that balance is, 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 is important. Um, you know, how they evolve their defensive system and maybe tweak that a bit, because it obviously didn't work against Dublin in, in 18, uh, and, you know, they had to figure out a, a, a more, uh, you know, maybe they have to figure out kind of like what, what Galway are trying to do at the moment and what Donegal did really well last year. Donegal went from a really kind of defensive team to all of a sudden this kind of expansive counter-attacking te team still but they definitely kept more people up front they definitely went away from the complete blanket so maybe Tyrone if they tweak that a bit will Mickey Hart do that will he go with something like that that he's probably maybe, not it's prob like, pro probably well, not at this there, stage because he stick to change, what he knows there was a change last year but the point when um, we were talking about it on Friday was that they were reverting back to the old game plan because McShane wasn't there it was like oh look what can we do now we, we've lost our best player all of a sudden that changes again and they can have a rethink. This this has the potential for that to be transformative. He's that good. Yeah, he is. And that's and that's the, they just have to they have to really work on it. And look, they haven't had him for the last number of weeks, obviously he's been down there, but they've loads of time to to work into the small bit through the league and then that break from league to championship to try and figure out, okay, how do we get the most out of this guy and how can this guy be a match winner? Because, you know, last year he was he was unplayable and if he's at that level again and there's no reason to say why well, he won't, if not even improving, because 
there's two things that can happen. The confidence that he can get from last year will catapult them to another level again. Yeah. Our teams now are actually so honed yeah. in on him that they're planning against him and that he actually finds it harder and that he gets frustrated in games. Inside, full forward is the most frustrating position in the world to play. You have to be so patient. And you see a lot of fellas that can't hack it in their patience-wise. They, they say, oh, I, I can't do... i got to go out and get on easy ball and get hand passes and, and play the game. Yeah, except the, the point you were making last week feeds in perfectly to this. If he feels that way, he can, he can make a loop run to somewhere near the 40 and they just need to ping it over to him and he's going to get a score, right? Yeah. And you've got to assume that they're working because he is such a good kicker yeah. that they're working on runs for him to get four or five of those a game. Exactly. Like, and like the whole argument we had as well last week about that it doesn't even have to be forward. It can be just across. Yeah. I feel like it can be a yard outside the 45 and a yard inside the 45 once or 20 yards apart. It's a, and I think when a fella's on the 45 and you're looking at him and you're marking him and he's looking up. You're defending back that way. Yeah, you're, you're kind of more worried about what's in here. You're not really worried and like teams will be dropping weak side to get bodies back. Like that, that is a one. We got caught with one. Carlo, um, I'm sure Pat Critchley had worked on it, but it was very good the way he'd done it. We forced him down one side. They'd come back out. We'd done everything right. We were pushing back out of the ball. We'd the weak side, half hour dropping. But they kicked that little cross field past the fella that was wide open. Do you know what I mean? Because in the old rules, that guy wasn't a danger at all. He was kind of like... like yeah, you could say out there all day. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. But he was a danger. This guy caught the ball, marked it, and kicked a raker of a point from 40 yards. And, you know, it, it was in that moment I goes, Jeez, this mark is, is, could be something that, you know, look, I said last week it needs to be tweaked. Is there anything going to be done? I think it has... To, I think Congress, they're saying Congress has to, has to do that, that we can't just say, oh, we're going to change it or we're going to tweak it or we're going to kill it all together. Um... But yeah, look, it'll be interesting what, what they do, what the Tyrone team do. But look, what they're going to get, what's guaranteed that they're going to get out of this news is a huge bolt of confidence. And everyone in that squad who was deflated a number of weeks ago saying, this guy's going to be down in Adelaide, he's gone. Um, or maybe all along, this was just something from McShane where it was a free holiday for three weeks and go down for a bit of a yeah, trial and, and look, enjoy the sunshine. Yeah, and, and, and not have to do the hard slog of winter exactly, training and you come back. Exactly, like, but they will definitely get a lift as a squad. Well. Like, just a, a couple of things there. The Donegal example, I think, is a good one, but they had Declan Bonner brought in two years ago, Stephen Rocher brought in last year. There is no real management change in Tyrone. In fact, they've lost their strength and conditioning coach. And I would say that management-wise, they've regressed. They lost Stephen O'Neill, didn't they? They've lost Stephen O'Neill. Sorry, what am I talking about? So, like, that would suggest even more if, like, Stephen O'Neill's press to be believed that they've regressed definitely in that department. And then I just wonder if there is enough change there to actually take them to the next level. I accept that they can get their way into a semi-final, but it's, there's almost a pressure now on Mickey Hart to go and replicate what they did last year and to go one step further that almost if he didn't have McShane last year and snuck into, or this year, and snuck into a semi-final, people would be like, Mickey Hart still got it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now this actually puts the pressure right back on him to go and somehow eke out... I don't know what their own fans expect, but they probably hope for an All-Ireland win at some stage. They, they, yeah, they want to get somebody into a final and they want to have a crack off them. And yeah. that, look, that's, that's literally all you have to do as a Tyrone guy. If you look at the, that game against Kerry, Jesus, we were worried last year at halftime. Like, yeah. I was up in the studio with Peter Canavan with Sky Sports and he was just grinning from cheek to cheek. It was the real kind of, it was the old Tyrone team. Like, we're, 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 we're frustrating them, we're starting to crack them, they're going to fold. And Kerry just said no after half time and yeah. came out and, 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 and took it back. But there was a key sequence in that game, if you remember, where Tyrone were on the attack, the extra pass was on, it was a bad pass, badly executed, it was intercepted. Stephen O'Brien got it, Ganey, back to O'Brien, goal. goal. Yeah. That key was, was, was the difference between putting Tyrone up four or five or Kerry getting back level or back behind, back, I think it was back level. So they would have been down four, now they were level in, in, in 30 seconds. Mm. And if you go four down against a team like Tyrone, it's going to be hard. And they'll be hoping they get a crack off of these teams again. They get back into a semi-final, find a bit of magic and get somebody on a wet day where they try and frustrate them. And McShane is the game of his life and gets 1-7 and Tyrone win the All-Ireland. That is not inconceivable. No. So as a squad, they will be. that's what they have to cling to. They, they can't cling to the fact that they have the Canavans and the Mulligans and no. the Stephen O'Neills. And we get up there, we'll be defensive. We've got the three best, three probably best forwards in the game. We get it up to them. That's Dublin and, and Kerry now with them three, with them forwards. But Tyrone have, have won not being the best team before. Yeah. I mean, no, they haven't. They were definitely the best team of that oh, decade. In 08. 08, <laughs> hold on. What are you talking about? Stop. <laughs> you know, best team of the decade. She even admitted it when you went where I see. Come here, um, they've added uh, Kevin Madden and Johnny Davis to the backroom team. Johnny Davis is the strength and condition. Kevin Madden is the ex Antrim footballer who was a uh, heavy scoring forward in his time, I think. Um, so I think there will be fresh voices sure. there. That's, that's that point. Um, let's move on. You want to talk about the. Um, 
Seamus Moynihan comments saying that there should be pay for that Australian clubs should compensate uh, somewhere in the GAA. So we were trying to work this out exactly what part of the GAA we get the compensation. Would it be the club? And if it is direct to the club, might the club blow it on an outside manager? You know, or should it go to a coach who is you know part funded by the provincial body? Like. Is club there some way? Club facilities, maybe? Maybe, automatic. Like, like the team could give them something to this, do something in the club. Yeah, so they, these floodlights or floodlights these or dressing the artificial rooms, pitch. Like, yeah. Artificial Training pitch. area. If only you know anybody who might be able to supply them at one. <laughs> I'll sort it out. <laughs> but yeah, no, like, like that's that's the only, like, going back into, you're right, you don't want to go back into being misspent on, on, you know, whatever. But facilities for GA clubs, you know, I'm thinking about Mark O'Connor going out with, with, with Dingle or Ty Kennelly going with the stole. You know, they could have done with it with a with a with a with a bolt of cash to go back in. It goes back into the kids, it goes back into whatever whatever they can do to improve the club, to entice more kids down to play, whether that be floodlights or whatever. But it's it's about the guys that have spent the generations getting Mark O'Connor to a point that they're doing that almost in a way for Dingle. They're doing it for the kid, but they're doing it for Dingle. Hopefully he'll win a county championship with Dingle when he's older. Hopefully he'll go on and win all Irons with Kerry. And then that's just snatched by some crowd over in Australia to come with the Bucks and take him. So on a free, on a free transfer, which is what it is really. Yeah. So maybe something that goes back in where where they can where they can feel not like so hard done by. Like Dingle are trying to win a county championship. They're a really good team. They've been knocking on the doors. And if they have Mark O'Connor, they probably have a championship within the last two or three years. Mark O'Connor is a possible Kerry captain. Paul Ganey could get the captain Kerry. There's a lot of ramifications for them losing Mark O'Connor. And Mark knows that. You know, Mark, I'm sure Mark comes back every winter and is kind of sitting there watching county championship games. Like I used to feel watching basketball games when Stacks were playing or when Kerry were playing or when I couldn't. That thing about being your heart, your heart strings being torn that you can't help your boys. Mark O'Connor grew up with these lads, won Hogan Cups, won minors with Kerry. And now he's to go around with a water bottle on the sideline and watch them lose county semi-finals or county finals. See fellas absolutely heartbroken in the dressing room. If Dingle were able to keep producing these young players and, and put it back into facilities, I, I, you know, I don't think there's any problem with it. I, I said that, I don't know that I tweeted or something a few months ago, but I said the same, that there should be something um, that makes it not as easy for these Aussies just to say, oh, we'll take Jar Gilroy and we'll you, try him for two years. He doesn't work it, he get injured, go, go back. There has to be real thought into, can this guy be the next Mark O'Connor? Because there's a lot of guys going down there. And, you know, there still is. Like, I'd love to know the percentage of fellas that are making it. The Zach Tuhis, the Mark O'Connors, the Ty Canellis. The, yeah, there, there's still a lot of them out there that, that, that you know, Begley had a great career with the Lions. Um, there's a lot of them out there that, that, that do well. But how many are we not really hearing about that go out and just come back within yeah. that year? You know, there's a lot, there's most a lot of, of that too. Most of them, definitely most, most of them. them, yeah. Yeah, like uh, that all makes a, a whole heap of sense. Ty Canelli was on, um, was it before Christmas, just after Christmas, and he said that uh, he had done a deal with the CEO of the AFL that there would be compensation, but that um, the GA at the time had turned it down because you can't put a value on the player if the player is amateur. It, it would have been in breach of their amateur status. Maybe it's time to Donation revisit that. Exactly, and that, that this isn't a payment for the player, that it is recognition of the development of something. That the hour, the hour is spent putting in to get the player to the, to the I, level I, where I, they're I, at, that they're good enough to go down to Australia and pick up a new game and go play. I understood why the GAA were doing that, because it suddenly opens up, you know, the, the GPA come in, the, the provincial council comes in, the county board comes in and says, but that player got good at development squads when we invested in strength and conditioning and nutrition and facilities. At, and, and the club is like, well, how much are we getting? So like, there's, there's the club nurtured the, the club nurtured the love though and the talent for that guy to get there. If that guy wasn't been looking after since he's five years old, below on Saturday mornings getting his coke and potatoes and falling in love with the sport and the game, he never gets to the development squads. You know, it is the club that gets you there. It's the club that always is the root of everything. So if a guy gets taken, it, I can't see why. Some sponsorship deal can't be done, that the Adelaide Crows can't be on the front of Dingle's jersey, I don't give a shit, but if they got 50k to put back into getting floodlights in their training pitch, they'd be delighted. Yeah, no, you're dead right. Okay, so let's talk about some of the games this weekend. Dublin against Monaghan is on Saturday night. We'll talk as well about uh, Armand Kildare in a couple of minutes time. Um, the games in Division 2 are pretty interesting. Dublin against Monaghan on Saturday night. Dublin have started the league quite well, despite the fact that um, it's, it's a first game out, everybody recognised the team. Second game out, was like, oh, there's significant changes here. Um, they're rolling at the moment. 
they're rolling. <laughs> they're unearthing new diamonds uh, all the time. Um, I thought McHugh was very good. I like it's amazing because it's it's these guys are coming in. These younger guys are coming into this team, and like they're just surrounded by class. And you know, if these young lads were coming into teams that you know weren't didn't have that, they mightn't be excelling like they are. But they're just coming in with so much confidence. The other guys are causing so much run power, uh, problems with their power runs. These guys are getting on the back of it. They're getting confidence in the back of seeing that around them. They're able to, to go forward and take their own chances. And yeah, look, they're they're in an absolutely unbelievable place. And uh, you know, Monaghan have beaten them the last three years in a row. Um, the one above in Clonus last year was a good game. It was a close game. Stephen O'Hanlon, the basketball player, got came on and and, and swung the game dramatically in Monaghan's favour. Um, but and 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 Monaghan had a great win against Tyrone last week. But. I, I just think the weekend will be will be a step too far, and I think Dublin are 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 looking at. I'd say this group are looking at maybe getting to another league final, and half hoping Kerry get through Something and having another crack off them again. Um, I think this Dublin team want to get a hold of Kerry and try and give them one of those beatings again to remind them that they're they're that much better. They haven't been able to do that the last number of years, and uh, I think it's bugging them a bit, and and they'll want they'll want that, and you know I'm sure Kerry want another crack as well. Just on the, the diamonds coming through, so I was just looking at um, TJ Reid there. I remember, came off the bench in that game against Waterford and scored five points in his first five possessions, and uh, the previous year he'd been on the bench for the All Ireland final against Limerick, where. It was the um, September of the year that Bally Hale had won a club final where he'd scored 2-2 in the club final. So that's the level of, of player that you had to be to get into that greatest Kilkenny team that was the greatest hurling team mm -hmm. of all time. Imagine how good you need to be to be impressing and training at the moment for the Dubs. And so if there is somebody who's getting a the chance, they are going to be very good. Yeah. They're earning it. What if this is a year where Dublin do a 2018 on it and it's crossed by everybody again? Like what if they do get Kerry in a league final and then hammer them in a league final? It doesn't exactly leave you. It doesn't whet the appetite that much for the summer. It do, it does, like a. Well, let's let's get into Kerry's defence then, because that's that's the one thing that would uh, their forwards will hold. Mm. If if it's a shootout, their forwards are going to be into it, right? And they they're going to be able to to bear comparison over eighty minutes or however long that that final is. But is the defence good enough? Is the Kerry defence good enough? I think when you peel back a layer of Kerry, and it's not just the defence. Um, they're not able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dublin. You have to say that they need to pray for fitness in so many departments. And now, when it comes to the forwards, that's just because we've got generational talents, and every team who has generational talents can't do that. In midfield, it's fairly obvious. When David Moore's not there, they're not as good in, in midfield. And I would say that Shane Ryan needs to stay fit as a goalkeeper. So you get to the six forwards. They're missing Tyke Morley and Tom O'Sullivan last week. And they were in big trouble. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're two, in my opinion, they're two best man markers. So like it's a double family. You have Gavin Crowley coming back from the half back line to Mark Shane Walsh, which is taking away what he can do going forward, which I think he's, he's brilliant going forward, and he's just not as good an inside marker as uh, O'Sullivan and Morley are. That if they get injuries to those two lads or in the backs department, I think they're in trouble. But do they need to come up with something, Kieran, as a failsafe? That that like when they did bring Paul Murphy back as a sweeper last year, it didn't always work. I don't think it was as bad as some people thought against Tyrone last year, for example. I thought that he, their uh, MO was to stop goals, and they effectively did that. They let McShane have his points. That I just wonder, did, they, did, did last week send alarm bells ringing that, right, if O'Sullivan and Morley are injured, we're not going to be able to handle the, these calibre of forwards? It's a good point. <clears throat> Look, Kerry can't, can't afford to lose those guys. No. You know, I think if you did have two of those guys out come the main business time of the year, you'd be in trouble. Um, maybe you'd be forced into looking at a more kind of team defence approach. I think they really went man to man last year, and I think it worked in a lot of aspects. And I think there's a huge amount to take out of it. And Peter Keane did a great job bringing in that real man to man stuff. Fellas were going out after men, but it also caught them a few times, even with the goals in the final. Con Callaghan did dummy runs, and Tom Sullivan was drilled to mark him and went out after him. And you know, guys were coming through the middle. So I think there might have to be a look at you know having the absolute desire to be a man marker and that's what Kerry did really well last year and it served us and it nearly stopped the five in a row don't don't forget that but just to cover as Owen's point made if you lose one of those guys to through injury and you can't do that and say it happens in a semi-final you lose one of these guys to injury or you lose him in the super eights if you lose a guy in the super eights no to a hamstring tear he's going to miss the rest of the championship yeah. possibly and um, so you have to maybe have some kind of other format looked at that is you know that it's a bit more team orientated. Maybe it's a bit more defensive. Maybe you play K 
can, of course, you can play in the counter attack with with the likes of Clifford, Stephen O'Brien, and, and Paul Ganey as your three inside forwards, and just go with that and and play them in a in a, in a straight line, you know, down the middle of the field, so they can break out either side and 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 get everybody else back and play a defensive type of of, of game, because you know, as Owen rightly says, if you lose two or three of them, no, Crowley will be back. And, and, and he, you know, where he is when he comes back, but I know him and I know how dedicated he is and he will have done everything right to get back to, to, to that peak and he'll be a huge addition to that back line. If you yeah. could throw him in and back at, on top of the six backs that we had there last year, no, there's fierce competition for places. Somebody's going to be pissed off losing out and they get better. Am I wrong that he is actually a prototype sweeper if you need him? I was just just thinking that when he said it, like, like definitely, you have he definitely has the brain and the athleticism to to kind of burst forward and physicality to make sure that no one's yeah, going to run. Yeah, he, he's a dog as well, though. Like you know, he, he and I mean that in, in the best sense of it, he's a dog, and you want your dog in somebody's face. And Crowley's as good as doing that as anybody. Can I? Can I? So like, um, coming off the back of the NFL season, right? The the best defenses do a little bit of everything. And, and it, they mix it up in the middle of a game and they, they mix it up before the play happens. So, like, couldn't you have... and Couldn't he be a sweeper for a part of a game and also a dog for a part of a game? And you just have, like... There's just a little bit of communication where it's like, OK, at the moment, I am the sweeper. I'm yeah. the mic. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to do the this. The start of the game against Dublin, for example, stop that early onslaught that tends to happen. Or maybe the start of the game, you put him on Kieran Kilkenny, yeah. and he's, he's absolutely in Kieran Kilkenny's face for the first 25 minutes. And at that point, you go, OK, right, this bit, we've got him now. We know exactly what he's going to do. We can put somebody else on him. I'm going to go back and just sweep for 15 minutes. Or the start for the throw-in, for example. Like, so just be... See, no, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great point you're making, Jern. That's the way the game is going, and that's what you're going to have. You're going to have teams that will be in the middle of a game or from a kick out there'll be a call and they'll go back into a defensive zone shape and they'll actually know that when they're in this zone the idea is, is that we're going to you know if you go out in the first 10 minutes and you're man to man and everybody's singled out and you're up you know you're really at fellas and then from a kick out the runner comes in and makes a call and your team goes into defensive structure and you're in that defensive structure knowing that when you get your turnover because they'll they'll come down it happens in basketball you come down the court in basketball and you're used to man to man and you're running all your sets then you come down the team throws a one three wouldn't you for a few minutes you kind of don't know what to do you're passing the ball or what are they doing where are they why why am i free where's my man gone why is he gone back there now and then you switch it back up again 10 minutes later he's back out hopping off you again that's keeping a forward, thinking it's keeping the team, thinking it's keeping the team on edge, it's keeping the team not knowing all the time what they're facing. And I think it's certainly something teams could look at and it's probably the next level and it's probably, you know, I don't know how far it is away where teams get to that level where they're actually switching defences in-game to keep the opposition on their toes and not let them set on one way they're playing. So if they're playing against them a, a, a mass zone, that they, you know, keep the ball out wide and they'll force you to come out but if you're switching it up, I think it, I think it certainly does give you options, and you know I think. Are, team, on the are Crowley... teams doing that? Do you think? Are we seeing that? <clears throat> I would say um, I don't know if they've I don't know if teams have got to that yet. I think there's certainly I think I think Dublin are the closest to it. And I think they've you know they've got their you know they've got their 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 clear tactical calls. Is is one is the fist up that we've talked about? That's that's the obvious one, but. Is there little nuances that they have or that they go to at times? There is. Are they just, you know, that example that we keep going back to last year about <coughs> Cluxton coming out and marking? Yeah. You know, have these th are, are these things being... Are, is there calls for these things? Is it just that they've done them so much in training that they know when that scenario arrives that they do it? But, you know, like, if a game... If a team is losing a point, are they not in a full pitch press? Yeah, is is everybody not up inside the forty five on a kick out kind of going? That's all offensive. Like the the the, the defensive conversations that we've all been having is like get bodies back and um, you know your sweepers need to be active and they need to make themselves uh, busy. But is that as is that as complicated as defending has got? I I I would think so. I think there's I think I think Dublin have very started this pushing teams down the sideline down and I think that's something that's going to catch on using the sideline like you would in basketball as as your friend I yeah. would say Mark Ingle might have had a, a lot to do with that um, trapping from behind sending the fella down the line and the second guy coming from behind so when you get him going down the line he starts getting confident he's looking up and then there's nothing on he turns around and when he turns around that, that second guy is coming from behind on, on, on the trap so 
they are they are you know they are very uh, dynamic defensively I would say Dublin and have and also that's backed up with having unbelievable backs so it's it's kind of it's the best of both worlds. Okay, um, we didn't talk about um, the games of Division 2. The other games this weekend, uh, so Dublin versus Mon on Saturday night. Donegal against Galway, we talked about in Shock Clock a little bit earlier on. Mead against Mayo. Mead, they're struggling a bit at the minute. They need to get a win there. Yeah, it's on in Mead, so they'll, they, that'll be massive to get a, to get a win. There's, that, that, there's a few big games. Yeah, there's other game, the big games in Division 2 are very, very interesting as well. Tyrone against Kerry, obviously. Um, that's going to be interesting. What's going to happen? Why didn't we call that one? Why didn't we, it was a good third game in, this week. You didn't yeah, want to. Igual, Igalo, we have to wait, oh, to wait four like months for, you, for this, this point it's, to figure out. It's all about the slow burn on the shot clock. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, I guess we didn't think that it would be... Like, is Colin McShane going to play this weekend? Yeah, I mean, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sure, be that of course he is. That's, well, he's not going to be on the touchline, or the um, terrace, like he was last time. Just straight in, yeah. That changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and the emotion lift that will give the fans and, and the whole of Tyrone above in Healy Park. <sighs> Big it's a tough crowd. place to go. Armagh against Kildare, Westmead against Fermanagh, Leash against Cavan and Ross Common against Clare. Armagh against Kildare is live on the telly as well, so a chance to see some Division 2 football. Right, it is 9.18am this morning. It's time for Virtual Insanity. I'm wearing a golf jumper. My name is John Duggan and this is Virtual Insanity, our PGA Tour slot every Thursday. We're trying to make a bit of money over the year with virtual money spent on virtual golfers. Actually, they're real golfers. I, I digress, real golfers. So they're playing tomorrow at the Pebble Beach Pro-Am. This is in California. Three courses used for the week. Two at Pebble Beach, two of the rounds. Iconic course, US Open venue. Spyglass Hill and Monterey Bay as well. So a lovely vista. Clint Eastwood, I think, has got a house up there. I think he was a mayor of a town, Carmel, at one stage. All these kind of interesting landscapes. And you want to be there on a Sunday night when you're in Dublin or in Cork or Limerick or wherever, in the rain and that kind of thing. But you're not. So you'll have to just bear with us and watch the golf on the Sunday night. So last week, I kind of had Webb Simpson in my head at 14 to 1. Uh, didn't pick him in the end, and then he won. So I don't really feel I'm that far off. Tony Fina, who he tipped the week before, ended up in a playoff. But a bad week at the Phoenix Open. Let's try and rectify that this week. But it's all about patience. It's all about keeping the faith in yourself, believing in yourself. I might be the last person to believe in this, but I still believe we can get winners here. So about this week's tips, here we go. Okay. Pebble Beach Pro-Am, Jason Day, 20 to 1 for four each way. Jason Day, actually, he's come in since I spoke, 18 to 1. They've cut him. I'm only joking. I didn't move the market. He actually is 18 to 1, Jason Day, for four each way in this Pebble Beach Pro-Am. Had back problems, Jason Day, right? But he's finished in the top five in the last three years in this tournament. Last time out, he was in the top 20 of the Farmers Insurance Open. I think he's coming back into form. 12 wins on the PGA Tour. Was one, number one in the world at one stage. Jason Day, I think, will be back there. We're all about the wilderness this week. It's wilderness week on Virtual Insanity. Jason Day, I like him. At a course he likes to get back in the winner's enclosure at 18 to 1, Jason Day. Second guy, also wilderness man, Jordan Spieth. Remember him, Jordan Spieth, the next blockbuster guy of golf. 11 wins on tour, including the Masters, the US Open, the Open Championship at Birkdale in 2017. He hasn't won since then. Can you believe it? You can probably believe it the way he hits the ball, but he's getting back into form with the ball striking. I know he missed the cut in Phoenix, but he's happier with his game. And I think for a guy who has the X factor at 40 to 1 in a tournament, he won by four shots in 2017. I think Jordan Spieth, you're taking a chance. He still might be out of form, out of sync. But if he comes back into form, a previous winner at 40 to 1 for three each way, Jordan Spieth, I think is a tasty price at 40 to 1. Finally, a player in form, Max Homa, twice. Uh, in the top 10 the last two events, contended in Phoenix last weekend, so he's in nice, rude health. Max Homa, 10th here last year at the Pebble Beach, and also when he wasn't playing very well on tour, he did finish well at Pebble Beach, so he likes the track, he likes these three courses they're playing on this week. Also won last year at the Wells Fargo, a w win under his belt, Max Homa, so he's my third selection this week. So gamble responsibly, never gamble more than you can afford. We're going eight places with bookmakers like Paddy Power, Ball Sports, Betfair and Skybet this week. Eight places. You've got to shop around for good value with a fifth of the odds. The three golfers for virtual insanity this week are the Wilderness Boys, Jason Day, four each way, 18 to 1. Jordan Spieth, three each way, 40 to 1. And Max Homa, the American, three each way at 50 to 1. Overall pot, 934. We'll get that back over a grand, hopefully this week. Good luck on virtual insanity. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Six Nations Show on OTB Sports Radio. The evolution of, of Ireland 
probably wasn't to the same degree over that period of time. Updates, analysis and opinion across all OTB channels from start to finish. I'm kind of sick of listening to them saying, oh, it's because they're the biggest playing pool in the world. Go on, Ireland! I've never seen a team like Ireland before. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Six Nations Show on OTB Sports Radio, Thursdays from 12. We support the Irish, the Irish. OTB Sports Radio, live online 24-7 on the Go Loud app. OTB AM. I, I would delve firstly into the psychology of English sport. And, and Keith played at Harlequins for many years, and we've had a couple of chats about the English psychology coming to Ireland. But I just see it time and time and time again right across English sport that when they get some success, they, they talk themselves up like you wouldn't believe. Like What Eddie said last week was appalling. And I, I got great respect. I mean, I joke about Eddie because I've been a competitor against him for many years. But, I, you know, I have great respect. He's, he's, he's made two World Cup finals. You know, he's won, won Super Rugby. Like he, he, the guys don't do that if you're, if you're a mug. He, and he survived 25 years. He's, he's phenomenal. But what he said last week was absolutely outrageous. But the English media didn't come out and say, oh, it's outrageous. The players didn't say, that's outrageous. They lapped it up. But that's when English teams fail. They talk it up publicly. You can talk it up inside your change room when no one's listening. Say, listen, boys, we want to win this World Cup. We're going to win it. But once you get out and you start pumping your own tyres up in public, the opposition get cross. And all it does is empower your opponents. And that's exactly what they did. And then things went wrong. It put pressure on the players. I've never seen Owen Farrell drop a ball twice in a game. And that's what happened. Uh, it's, uh, are, do, are we buying this? English arrogance has um, cost England. Is this not just like a team with a hangover from the World Cup? I don't think they've talked themselves up after the, they got hammered in the World Cup final. Like, it wasn't close. They weren't in that game. Mm. I blame the early injury to Sinclair, like... I would have thought there is a huge degree of arrogance about it all. But whether or not it cost them the game, it's a different question. I'd, I'd say there it, has it, to it, it cost them the game on the point that they went out there kind of thinking that they'll just win. And it's, it's, it's you know, I, <laughs> I made the point in the basketball team, it's like when you're, uh, you can't f- turn on the switch in the middle of a game. You have to be up for the game mentally at the start. I equated it to like when you wake up in a hotel in a strange place after coming home at four or five in the morning and you're trying to find the light for the toilet. <laughs> Do you know that scanning the walls one? Yes. That's what it's like in a game when you're not tuned in and you haven't been psychologically ready for the battle. Uh, you have to be mentally up for it. And last week was, was a prime example of that. It happens weekly in all codes where a team goes, we'll win. We'll win and you can talk. You can talk about it in meetings. You can say, we, we have to be ready for it. But unless the players actually have that fear of losing or are bought into it, were you playing in that game against Antrim where they nearly beat you that year in the back door? Were you playing that game? No, I wasn't. No. I was injured. Right. That's why they, were, they were, got nearly beaten. Did, uh, what was the next? Sligo was the next one, was it? Sligo, Sligo yeah. Were you playing yeah. that game? No, I was, I, that oh, was the year days. I broke them in a tarsal. Yeah, oh, I had right, nothing so. to do with those bad performances. <laughs> no, I'm only messing. Um, but yeah, look, it was it's exactly that. that you, you know, and, 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 and what seeps in from the outside is even more dangerous. As in, you can tell, you can, you can tell, you know, your own team and your own teammates. Oh, we must be ready. We must be ready. But it's when you go home and well, who are you playing the weekend? It's like, oh, you'll beat them in Tralee. Ah, oh, Jesus. Yeah. And that just seeps in. And that's what happened in England. They went out to France last week. They thought this was going to be a piece of cake. And in fairness to them, as bad as they were and as bad as it was going, they found the switch eventually. They and, did. And and and. Looked like at a stage that this was very possible for them to come back. Now there were inspirational tries from Johnny May, but you would have felt that they did have the ch- chance to come back. But it, the French copped on again. But uh, I think you'll see a different England England the weekend, and I think you'll see a, an England that were hurt by last week and have a point to prove and no better people to prove it against than the Scots for them. I wonder do England feel that they need to be in an unbelievably dominant position? And they're very much based on a kind of a, a bold or rolling down a hill method because, like, once France scored an early try, they're like, well, we're not going to hammer them. So, what's the point? Like, Eddie Jones in his pre match comments was like, we need to bully them. And, like, today it's like, we, we want to, to go hard at them. And, like, there's a lot of, like, I put it, I described him like a, an MMA fighter earlier on. There is a lot of kind of boxing talk, like, like pummeling a team, pulverizing them. It's very violent. Uh, 
kind of um, dialogue from the English players and management. Like, there's there is an air of violence about what they're saying that they need to hammer a team and like uh, keep punching their bloodied corpse. That seems to be the English rugby mentality, um, which is I guess when you're reading it, it's kind of sometimes a little bit horrific to read. But public like, schoolboy bullies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but when, you, when you see when you see the old lines videos, you see them in the dressing room getting ready to play and. They do. That's you it's, know. They, it, it, it like it, you're, it's boxing. It, it's warfare. Like you know, if you're if you're if you're a forward, if you're not in that frame of mind, you're not in the you're not in the right vicinity to be playing in in in, in especially a, a, as a forward. You you have to be in that absolute war. It's a war zone nowadays. It's but like for England. Then last week, it's a case of oh my god, we're not going to be able to you know urinate on a dead body here today. We're not going to be able to hammer this team. We're actually going to have to win a rugby match, and perhaps that doesn't actually help the English psyche, this rugby team, they need to hammer everybody. And if they're in uh, a real dogfight then, like I know... I go against you and I just say that they just literally thought that this was going, they were going to batter them and bully them. And yeah. they thought the scoreline was going to be 44-16 and then they could come out and say afterwards, yeah, we did bully them. But of course, when you keep saying that and you have a belief that you're going to win, one, you're riling up the French and the French are very proud nations, so they're saying they will in their shit bully us. We'll come back right back at them and that's that's just, just that's what happened. They started to get a foothold in the scrum as well and they did start to bully the French and they did get back into the game as a result of that. That's so, true, yeah. Um, uh, look, there's definitely something to it though. Uh, right, last story that we want to talk about this morning was the potential for Leo Messi to end up Manchester City. Yesterday on the show, Graham Hunter told us that there's a clause in Leo Messi's contract which allows him uh, to leave for free at the end of every season if he chooses to do so. Now, there's a lot of politics going on in Barcelona. There are always a lot of politics going on, and uh, Messi was just slapping Abidal down. But if you're Manchester City and Pep Guardiola, what are you doing to try and woo Leo Messi at this point? Everything. Champions League, you are the missing piece of the jigsaw. You don't need to woo him much. You've got Pep Guardiola. He's got yeah. a load of money. He's available for free at the end of the season, as you it's said. It's an amazing clause to have in his contract. His agent like deserves a pay rise. <laughs> a million a week, netto. That thought will give you fifty million. You won't even have to do those Pepsi ads anymore. What, like, what is it? But it, it's not money that's going to motivate him. So, like, it's no, it isn't money that's going to motivate him. It's, it's the new challenge, though, that might motivate him. It's something different that might might motivate. Like, he, like, no matter what he does, he's an absolute icon in Barcelona for the rest of his life. So, whether he goes now or never goes, nothing that like you look at him yesterday. He went off to China and. Whenever he comes back to Spain, he'll be red carpet rolled out him into the training ground and all that. And Messi would be the same. And you know, even <clears throat> it'd be kind of like the time Zola came to the Premiership, like it, you know, that little bit of magic coming back into the coming back into the thing. And he would be just absolutely unbelievable at City, and and it would really spice up the Premiership. It'd make the Premiership so much more exciting every week. We wouldn't have yeah, to be watching to Spain to watch. Uh, absolutely, it would. Let, let's, call, let, let, let's not fool, fool around here. Man City launched Messi into that team and they're going to be challenging Liverpool next year. That's a fact. Yeah, he gets, like, gets the opportunity to play at Turf Moor and things like that, which should be like, put on the contract in front of you. Come, come to the Premier League, Daniel. This will be I'd say really what will be on his contract is he's not playing in Turf Moor. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think this is going to happen. But, like, imagine if you're Eric Abadon and you're the guy who was responsible for letting Lionel Messi go. Like that is not the, the, the person you want to be in Barcelona. You're getting sacked that day. <laughs> Immediately. It's like, we, we're blaming you. You're going to go out front. You're going to make the announcement well, he, that it's like, happening, yeah, the, the, and then you're coming in here, and we're this is your stuff. But the, has, the hassle that, that, like, if he if he goes, whatever manager is there, that if he's anything to do with it, like his job is untenable, really going yeah. forward. Because as soon as start next year, lose lose four or five games, it'll be oh my god, get rid of this guy. He lost his Messi, and he's losing. If you're Messi, is there any is there any victory to be had in leaving Barcelona? So you're leaving a place where no matter what you do, the end of your career is going to be considered. They're like, you can wind down happily and nobody at Barcelona wants you to leave. So if you go to City, there's massive pressure on you. You've got to, you've got to reach the peak of your career, even though you're fading as a, as a player. Not that much, but like a little bit. Is there anything to be gained from Messi's point of view in going? Uh, from Messi's point of view, like if you think that working with Pep Guardiola would bring you another Champions League medal because he is so desperate for it, then yes, of course there is a point of going. All right, on that note, thanks lads. That's all from us this Thursday morning here on OTB AM. Uh, back in your radios tonight with Off the Ball from 7 o'clock. You can subscribe to the OTB AM podcast, fully timestamped, so you can flick through for whatever bits you want. Michael Brick Walsh, your top five stories this morning. The Shot Clock with Kieran Donaghy, our weekend Gaelic football preview, virtual insanity, and much more besides. If you missed anything, you can get us on YouTube. OTB AM, Ireland's first and only sports breakfast show. We're here every morning. We'll see you tomorrow. Good luck. OTB AM. This 
is OTB Sports 